Welcome, everyone. Good afternoon. Exploring the feasibility of offshore wind energy for the California North Coast webinar will begin momentarily. We have the lines muted, and we welcome you to complete the poll that is on your screen, and we will begin very shortly. Thank you. Welcome folks hopping on the line. We will begin momentarily. You are at the right spot. This is the Exploring the Feasibility of Offshore Wind Energy for the California North Coast webinar, hosted by the Schatz Energy Research Center at Humboldt State University in partnership with the Ocean Protection Council. The lines are muted. We will keep them on mute to minimize background noise. If you're experiencing any technical difficulties hopping on the webinar, please email windstudies at shotcenter.org or send a message via the chat. Okay, welcome everyone. Good afternoon. It is 2.01, so I'm going to begin in an effort to keep us on time. Welcome, my name is Sarah Shen with Strategic Earth Consulting and on behalf of the Schatz Energy Research Center at Humboldt State University, in partnership with the Ocean Protection Council, we thank you all for joining us for today's webinar. This is the second in a series of five webinars on the topic of offshore wind energy for the California North Coast. For those of you who joined us last week, welcome back. And for those tuning in for the first time, hello, thanks for joining us. And we're really happy that you're here with us today. Whether or not you tuned in last week, we wanted to flag that the agenda, the PowerPoint slides, and the relevant report from the first webinar are posted on the SHOT Center's website. This webinar is being recorded and the recording will be made available at the Shot Center website for those who were unable to attend today's meeting, or if any of you would like to have another go at today's meeting and listen to those presentations. Closed captioning is available. You will just need to click on the CC on the bottom of your screen to enable it. And these captions can also be um, viewed at a URL that we're going to drop into the chat. That's been dropped, fantastic. So some of you may be aware that this webinar series was originally intended to be an in-person workshop in the spring, and it was postponed due to the COVID-19 pandemic. So the SHOT Center, with the support of the California Ocean Protection Council, have been working very hard to redesign that workshop into a series of webinars, five to be exact, to engage with the broader North Coast community and others that are interested in the topic of renewable energy. And they're excited to continue these conversations with all of you over the next few weeks. We do also want to recognize that our North Coast community um, and the world at large are dealing with many other commitments and some might say stressors. Um, and so for those that are affected on the West Coast by the fires, we're thinking of you and your loved ones and we're sending you well wishes that you'll continue to stay safe. Um, you know, we're all human. We're also here feeling the added stress related to the pandemic, homeschooling, social justice reform, and everything else. So we just wanted to say again from the bottom of our hearts, thank you for making space to join us for today's conversation because it's an important one and we're excited to be here despite everything that's going on. So once more, um, before I dive into the agenda and talk about the webinar flow, if you're experiencing any technical difficulties, such as you can't view the screen share, um, or you don't see a Q&A box where later you can submit questions, we invite you to email windstudies at shotcenter.org. It's also shown on your screen. 
or send a message via the chat and we'll be happy to help you. We certainly don't want your participation um, to be impacted because of technology difficulties. We have muted all of participants and we will keep everyone on mute in, or in an effort to minimize background noise. And lastly, I've mentioned this before, there is a poll that is live, so we welcome you to complete that poll. We'll speak more about it. Um, responses are anonymous, but we just love to get to know who's joined us for today's call. Okay. So I would like to now turn it over to Dr. Arnie Jacobson, director of the SHOT Center to continue with the introductions. Uh, thank you, Sarah, and um, good afternoon and welcome to all of you. Uh, as Sarah noted, this is the second in our series of five webinars on the feasibility of offshore wind uh, energy on California's North Coast. My name is Arnie Jacobson and I'm director of the SHOTS Energy Research Center at Humboldt State University. Um, as I mentioned last week, uh, for the past 18 months, our team and partners have carried out a multi multidisciplinary study to examine various aspects of offshore wind feasibility. Uh, this work has been supported with funding from the Ocean Protection Council of the California Natural Resources Agency, the Governor's Office of Planning and Research, and the Federal Bureau of Ocean Energy Management. Uh, Pacific Gas and Electric also contributed by providing self-funded analysis related to transmission and alternatives, and we are grateful for all of this support. Here on the North Coast of California, we have a phenomenal offshore wind resource. Developing this resource offers an opportunity to generate substantial amounts of renewable energy, thereby contributing to efforts uh, um, to address uh, global climate change. Offshore wind also offers an opportunity to create jobs and contribute to economic development in our region. Uh, last week, we discussed this opportunity while also noting challenges related to transmission infrastructure and economic viability. Uh, we need to act quickly uh, and with urgency to address climate change, but this does not mean that other concerns such as local environmental impacts, cultural resources, geologic hazards, and conflicts with existing activities can be set aside. If offshore wind is to be developed, it has to be done thoughtfully and with care. Uh, this week we will focus on the ecological and geological setting of the North Coast and the associated implications for uh, possible offshore wind development in this region. Uh, uh, we designed the research we are presenting in this series to provide information to help a variety of interested parties consider the opportunity of offshore wind along with challenges and barriers. As noted last week, our objective is to provide reliable, unbiased information about the feasibility of offshore wind development. This work has been carried out without uh, support from commercial or private interests related to offshore wind development. And while we are proponents of the need to identify and implement solutions to climate change, our work on this set of projects does not represent advocacy for offshore wind. Our goal is instead to present rigorous analysis that increases understanding of the possibility uh, of offshore wind development on the North Coast and the associated pros and cons. Um, it's now my pleasure to introduce Mark Gold, Executive Director of California's Ocean Protection Council under Mark's leadership, the Ocean Protection Council has worked to support rigorous research aimed at understanding the environmental and so socioeconomic dimensions of offshore wind development, including work uh, that is being presented here today. The Ocean Prote Protection Council is a major sponsor and partner for this web webinar series, and it is an honor to have him make remarks to open today's session. So I'll pass it over to you, uh, Mark. Thank you so much. Um, first of all, I, I wish we were all there. I, I think it would be a heck of a lot better um, than what we're doing, but I really want to thank everybody, um, including you, um, Arnie, um, as director of Humboldt State Shots Energy Research Center, um, for uh, in working with Chris Potter at the Ocean Protection Council, who's our energy lead, um, and um, and everyone else to to really try to accommodate the times and really make this accessible everybody. Also want to thank you for the North Coast Offshore Wind Feasibility Study effort that you've done so far, um, which is very helpful. To put this in context, um, I, I think first, just to let everybody know what the Ocean Protection Council is. Um, so uh, we're, in essence, 
um, the policy advisors to uh, the um, Governor Newsom administration on all things coast and ocean. Um, and uh, to that end, one of the big things that we've done in the last year is on February, the Ocean Protection Council approved a strategic plan to protect California's coast and oceans. And it included goals and milestones and metrics. And there were four major areas of goal, goal areas, which were climate and equity and biodiversity and the blue economy. And, and clearly offshore wind falls under two of those in goals and the blue economy. Our work on the North Coast, um, we've been doing a lot of work on their uh, um, tribal MPA stewardship effort um, is, is one of the things that we're very excited about working um, working on in the, on the North Coast. Also a lot of work um, with the kelp forest crisis um, in uh, Sonoma and Mendocino County um, and doing a lot of work uh, with part partnering with a wide variety of community groups up there. So we have been doing a, a lot of work on the North Coast. The context um, uh, commissioner, CEC commissioner Karen Douglas talked about last week um, of our need for a diversified energy portfolio in the state of California. Um, she talked about obviously the context of um, California's global leadership um, in reducing greenhouse gas emissions through Senate Bill 100 um, regulatory requirements, um, as well as um, uh, increasing uh, vehicles, zero emission vehicles um, through mandates there. So uh, I'm not gonna get into that work. That's more the CEC's effort, but we are working quite closely with them. And this is really through Chris, working with Karen and her staff um, on the offshore wind issue and just really making sure as California moves forward and makes decisions that what we do on offshore wind is we do it right. Um, and that's, that's really important. And within that strategic plan that I referred to earlier, um, objective 4.4.1, um, we made it really clear that we, we commit the Ocean Protection Council to work with other state agencies towards the development of a commercial scale offshore wind project that minimizes impacts on marine diversity and habitats, currents and upwelling, fishing, cultural resources, navigation, and aesthetic and visual impacts, as well as military operations. And we want to do it quickly, by 2026 if possible, to really get something going um, if it meets those criteria. And to that end, um, uh, two primary actions have to move forward. One is we need to work with partners to develop a statewide policy that will actually establish these criteria by 2024 to ensure that we're doing responsible evaluation and potential implementation of these offshore wind projects. And of course, they have to be consistent with state and federal law. And then secondly, we need to continue to fund research and baseline data collection um, to assess the environmental and socioeconomic impacts of potential offshore wind projects. And to that end, we've been funding research, um, such as the work being featured in today's webinar, um, that hopefully will provide useful and important information um, during the environmental analysis of offshore wind energy projects in California. Earlier this year, the OPC launched a study with the Conservation Biology Institute and Point Blue Conservation Science that addressed action two by assessing and analyzing the existing body of information on the marine environment contained within California offshore wind energy gateway. And this study will be completed by the middle of 2021. Interim work products from the study will be presented at future public meetings and workshops. Last, but certainly not least, the OPC is currently finalizing a grant with the Humboldt Fishermen's Marketing Association for a mapping exercise that will directly involve fishermen from Del Norte, Humboldt, and Mendocino counties. Mapping parameters will include species and species um, uh, a complex gear type, fishing area by depth, seafloor, substrate, and season. Results will become public and presented in an electronic GIS format. And this mapping will establish an accurate baseline of current fishing fleet activities and provide a long-term tool to register climate change-driven species migration and fishing efforts shift over time. Um, and with that, back to you, Professor Jacobson. Uh, th thank you very much, Mark. And I, I think uh, I'll pass it over to Sarah. Fantastic. Thanks, Arnie, and thanks, Mark, for those welcoming remarks. 
I'd like to now invite Gary George, Clean Energy Director for National Audubon Society and the Power Working Group to provide his, work, his opening remarks. Gary, welcome, and please turn on your video if you wish to. There you go. Hello, everybody. Thank you, Arnie, for inviting me today. Um, our science team here at National Audubon Society, you know, we have 27 state uh, programs. We have 465 chapters. We have nature centers throughout the US. We have 2 million members. Uh, my initiative for clean energy is part of the climate strategy. And our science team uh, revealed in a study released last year that three degrees of warming will likely drive 389 species of North American birds to extinction because they'll lose their wintering and breeding territories due to climate change. So you can look deeper into this study. We have an amazing um, online website at climate.audubon.org. So it is exciting to have a new resource, a new technology to add to our quiver of climate arrows here in California, like offshore wind, to get us to 100% clean and net zero emissions. This is critical for birds and it's critical for people. It's exciting to see, uh, as, a, as I've been working on this, it's exciting to see here in California, the conservation ethic and the climate politic policies going hand in hand to protect our beloved wildlife of the current of uh, the California current system. It's a very unique biodiversity, um, only in California and the Pacific. Um, and we have a long standing tradition of conservation ethic here. Offshore wind will have impacts on birds, it will, but we can manage them with the right science and technology. So getting there, I wanna thank OPC, I wanna thank CEC, I wanna thank BOM and USGS and other federal and California agencies that are stepping up helping fund research, um, two shots for this important research here and to others. I also want to give a quick shout out to my colleagues in POWER, Pacific Offshore Wind Energy Research Collaboration. It's NGOs, conservation organizations, industry, and some wind associations. And so I just want to call out a few of those, CBD, NRDC, Environmental Defense Center of Santa Barbara, OWEA, California, POET, EDPR, Orsted, Equinor, and the Center for Law and Energy and the Environment at UC Berkeley. Thanks guys. And on to our important research report from Arnie and the Schatz. Thank you so much. Fantastic, thank you, Gary. Okay, I'm just going to screen share. Hey, so again, my name is Sarah Shen, and together with my colleagues Kelly Sates and Carolyn Kraft, Strategic Earth has been contracted by the SHOT Center to help design and to facilitate this webinar series. So we may tag team together to help guide you through today's webinar. We will also be leading the development of a webinar summary report that I will speak to in just a bit. But I wanted to mention that as neutral facilitators, we're committed to upholding an inclusive, transparent, and productive dialogue today and for the remaining webinars. So if you have any questions or concerns about how we're supporting this webinar or future webinars, please contact us directly at hello at strategicearth.com. And we will drop that link into the chat in just a moment. So, Hopefully you've had some time to complete the poll. Uh, Maya, I would love for you to release those poll results so we can see who has joined us. Fantastic. Okay, so it looks like we have 44% of our participants identifying as from the California North Coast region. We have 34% from outside of the North Coast, but also but still within California. 22% um, outside of California and no international folks. So we have a good, a good mix of local and non-local. Thank you all for completing that poll. So if you are experiencing any technical difficulties or you cannot view the screen share, this will probably be the last time I will say it, please email windstudies at shotcenter.org or send a message via the chat. I've mentioned that this webinar is being recorded, transcribed, and closed captioned, and the webinar recording will be available on the SHOT Center website in the next few days. And again, to get those closed captioning, you can click on the CC on the bottom of your screen, and we can also drop in um, a link to, to go to those closed captions directly. All participants are muted and will remain muted throughout the duration of the webinar to eliminate background noise. 
in an effort to take as many questions as possible and adhere to the time frames within our agenda, we encourage you to submit questions via the Q&A, which you should see on your screen as an option. It's a little chat or by emailing windstudies at shotcenter.org. This method of taking questions worked really well for us during the first webinar. And so folks opted out of doing the raise hand function and speaking for themselves in an effort for us to be able to get through as many questions um, as possible. And so this allowed us to address significantly more um, questions than we had anticipated, which is exciting. So we'll proceed through today's webinar using Q&A and email. And we can always adjust for the next webinar if, um, if needed. So thank you for your patience. We're just trying to operate seamlessly with a large number of attendees. So to help ensure that we can complete today's webinar at 4.30 p.m., we recognize that we may not get to all of the questions. Um, we, on our, on our end, will consider the questions that come in and we'll plan to select a few that represent a diversity of perspectives and consider both the local and non-local um, community members that have joined us for today. These will be the questions that we read out loud as a first priority, and we will continue through our queue to get through as many questions um, as possible while staying on time. Um, wanted to mention that you don't need to worry if you don't hear your question addressed out loud during today's webinar. The SHOT Center is still taking all questions um, in whatever form that they receive them. They're reviewing all questions and they will put together a public facing frequently asked questions, an FAQ document that will be available at the close of the webinar series. And so the FAQ will share the most frequently asked questions, whether or not they were asked out loud during the webinar, as well as the SHOT Center's responses to those questions. So please don't worry if we um, you know, can't get to your question today, it, it most definitely will still be considered. I can promise you that. It is our intention to support a collaborative and a productive conversation. And so to help us achieve this goal, we have a variety of tools, many I've already mentioned. So we have the chat. This is your space to convey any technical issues and we can help to address them. We don't want technology to stop you from participating um, at your fullest capacity. The Q&A and the email are the two ways that we will be taking questions. Um, so we want to hear from folks. So please submit your questions at any time throughout the webinar, during presentations, while I'm speaking, during the panel discussion, and then at the appropriate time, we'll come to those queue, queue um, of questions. There is one poll, so thank you for those that uh, completed that. And we will tell you a little bit about a Google Form survey um, in a few minutes, but those are two other ways that we're trying to you know, hear from folks about your webinar experience and also get to know who is joining us since we can't be in a room all together. So today's agenda, as well as the two wind studies reports, that are most relevant to today's discussion have been posted to the SHOT Center website. And so you'll see those links um, on your screen and we will drop those into the chat. Today's webinar will focus on sharing information in the existing conditions and potential environmental effects report, as well as the feasibility of potential subsea cable corridor scenarios report. There is another uh, report that talks about geologic and seismic hazards, and that's still in the final stages of development and review. It's anticipated to be available in early October, and all of these reports are available on the SHOT Center website or will be made available when they are complete. So we encourage you to download um, these two links, or these two reports that are linked here and included in the chat if you're finding yourself wanting more information about today's topic in particular. I would also like to take a few minutes um, to invite you to share your feedback about your experience during today's webinar whenever you go. So we acknowledge that folks may not be able to stay with us all the way until 430. So we are going to drop a link to a Google form survey in the chat and we welcome you to visit that chat or visit that survey uh, before you depart. All feedback shared will be anonymous. So we are not collecting names and personal information. Uh, we really do appreciate your feedback if you're willing to share it because it helps us to identify areas in need of improvement so we can make these webinars more enjoyable for the remaining, um, for the remain of the series. 
The survey will also be emailed to all registered participants as part of the next steps after today's webinar, and it will be open until Friday, September 25th, so until this Friday. And we will also remind folks to complete that survey when we get to the final agenda item at the close of the webinar. We just wanted to share it now in case folks have to hop to other commitments. A summary will also be developed for the webinar series that highlights the key themes and the discussion items and will be made available to the public on the SHOP Center website before the Thanksgiving holiday. Poll and survey results may be included in the summary. And again, all feedback shared is anonymous. And lastly, as I've mentioned, there will be a FAQ document developed for the entire webinar series. So not one for each webinar, but one across all five webinars that will consider all questions submitted, whether or not they were read out loud during the webinar that you participated. And that FAQ will also be made available to the public on the same timeline as the summary report. So being mindful of the large number of participants that we have today joining us, we are going to move forward with the understanding that everyone is willing to abide by the webinar agreements that are shown on your screen. Listen to build mutual understanding, openly discuss ideas and issues with others, and respect the diversity of perspectives. Explore ideas where common ground is the goal. Contribute to an inclusive and collaborative environment. Speak openly and honestly. Keep comments concise and focused. Limit distractions and multitasking. Address any concerns about the webinar with the project team via the chat or email. And personal attacks and disrespectful behavior will not be tolerated. So thank you all in advance for committing to those webinar agreements so we can have a really productive and enjoyable webinar experience. So the goals for today's webinar um, are included in the agenda, which is available on the website. And there are three goals. We want to continue to engage with the North Coast community and others that are interested in renewable energy about the feasibility of offshore wind energy for the California North Coast. The SHOT Center will be sharing key findings from the offshore wind energy studies that they've conducted alongside their research collaborators on the topic of environmental and geologic settings that could be impacted by wind farm development on the North Coast. And lastly, our goal is to facilitate a Q&A and to learn of community knowledge and perspectives about exploring local offshore wind energy development, and in particular, any insights you all have about the ecological and geological considerations. So a brief snapshot of our agenda today. Um, we are wrapping up the welcome and goals and we'll move um, quite soon to the recap of the first webinar highlights. And then we will have um, a more detailed agenda item where we'll hear presentations regarding research findings related to the ecological and geological environment. And this is also where we'll have a, um, hopefully a lively panel discussion. And then we will move to the community Q&A and discussion. So all those questions that you'll be submitting via the chat and the email will be um, addressed and considered during this time. And then we'll close um, with next steps and participant feedback, welcoming you to complete that Google Form survey if you're comfortable and um, have us adjourn at 4.30. So we will not be taking any scheduled breaks, so you know, please take care of yourself. And we may need to adjust the timing in real time to reflect the needs of the participants and the discussion. So thank you in advance for your flexibility. Okay, so let's move into our first, um, agenda item and I would love to um, pass it over to Arnie in just a few minutes to do a recap of the first webinar highlights. So recognizing that some of you were unable to attend the first webinar, Arnie is going to provide a brief overview of the key aspects of offshore wind technology and also speak to how offshore wind may contribute to California's clean energy and climate targets. We also heard about that a little bit during the opening remarks. Arnie will also highlight the purpose and the scope of the Shot Center Offshore Wind Energy Studies so that everyone can enter today's webinar with the same foundational knowledge, whether or not you participated in the previous webinar. And I just wanted to share the reminder that this webinar series is intended to delve into the various aspects of the studies and the related reports 
to share information in a digestible and a topical manner. And so this, the first webinar was focused on setting the stage, helping folks to understand the potential for the strong winds off the North Coast to generate energy, while also recognizing the opportunities and the challenges associated with energy transmission and economic development. And then today we'll be focusing on the ecology and the ge geologic considerations. So I'm gonna keep the lines muted, invite questions while Arnie speaks via the Q&A and the email, and I will hand it over to Arnie. Arnie, please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Sarah, and thanks also to um, uh, Mark Gold and Gary George for your uh, earlier earlier remarks. Um, let me just share my screen. Um, so, as Sarah mentioned, I will um, I give a very brief recap of um, uh, some of the, the highlights from the last session, as well as describe the scope of, of, um, of our broader set of studies. And uh, we'll present just a few slides that are related to potential uh, uh, environmental benefits associated with, uh, with the possibility of offshore wind development. Um, uh, so starting off, just uh, putting this in the context of the, of the, um, the uh, research that was was conducted. Uh, it was a, a multidisciplinary study that covered a, a range of different topics, as uh, indicated here. Uh, last week's webinar covered resource assessment, grid compatibility, and uh, transmission-related issues, the potential for a subsea cable, and economic analysis. Um, this week's uh, webinar will focus on environmental uh, impact and uh, geologic and seismic uh, associated uh, issues. Um, uh, just as a very brief uh, summary of key points from the first uh, webinar, uh, first we discussed or noted that the um, offshore wind resource on the north coast is enormous um, and could support progress towards meeting California's climate and clean energy goals. Um, we also noted that transmission is a major barrier for developing offshore wind on the, on the North Coast. Um, in terms of economic viability, we noted that uh, larger wind farms achieve lower cost of energy due to economies of scale. And so while smaller initial projects might be used to demonstrate the technology, developers will likely want to see a pathway to larger projects to achieve economic viability. And in, uh, there's also a significant uh, opportunity for economic development. Um, uh, offshore wind has good potential to create uh, a significant number of jobs in the region as well as elsewhere in California. Um, and uh, just as one example, a 150 megawatt wind farm could create approximately 3,000 construction jobs and 2,000 uh, operational or ongoing uh, jobs. Um, uh, I'll also just spend a few minutes uh, recapping um, a, a few things related to the technology for, for context. Um, uh, because of the deep waters along the U.S. West Coast, offshore wind would need to use uh, floating platform uh, technology. Um, this is uh, an emerging technology that has been demonstrated through installed systems uh, uh, primarily in Europe, but is still uh, very much an, uh, an emerging approach compared to um, uh, fixed foundation uh, offshore wind systems, which are which are much more common, uh, as well as land-based uh, wind farms. Um, the uh, uh, offshore wind systems are are quite large. Um, in the context of our study, we were uh, we assumed in in running scenarios a 12 megawatt turbine would be used, um, which would involve a hub height that's about 450 feet above. The ocean surface and in this diagram we include a humpback whale um, here for scale uh, uh, in the image this is about a 43 foot long uh, humpback whale so um, you can see that the systems are are quite large um, in terms of the study scenarios we looked at three different scales or sizes of wind farm development a 50 megawatt um, uh, pilot scale development that might involve four 12 meg megawatt um, uh, turbines and 150 uh, megawatt, which might be sort of a small commercial scale uh, development that might involve on the order of 12 turbines. And then a full build out of the Humboldt call area, which is shown here 
uh, by this outline, uh, you, uh, you might be able to put something on the order of 1800 megawatts, um, which might be uh, just a, a little over 150 turbines uh, in that area. Um, so we studied uh, all three of those uh, scales. We also looked at three different transmission scenarios. One would be connecting to the main, uh, 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 connecting to the larger state grid by going overland to the east. Uh, a second uh, was going overland to the south. And then the third uh, scenario was an undersea cable um, that would connect uh, uh, in the Sa San Francisco Bay Area. And so as we look at um, the environmental uh, setting and the geologic and, and seismic issues, um, these set of scenarios were, were what they were considering in that context as well. Um, in thinking about uh, uh, offshore wind, uh, as I mentioned last week, um, it's important to uh, consider it in the context of climate change and the urgent need to, to take action, uh, both here in our region as well as around the world. Um, California has set aggressive targets um, for, clean, uh, for addressing climate change and, and, um, and uh, expanding the use of clean energy. Um, and those targets are summarized very, very briefly here. Um, and we noted that um, offshore wind could be a part of, of, of the solution. Uh, potentially um, uh, for meeting California's goals. Um, in terms of environmental benefits of offshore wind, I think it's useful to start by noting that offshore wind has relatively low life cycle greenhouse gas emissions. Um, this graph shows um, uh, the, the greenhouse gas emissions intensity of offshore wind in units of grams of carbon dioxide equivalents per kilowatt hour. Uh, uh, shown here on the y-axis for three different technologies. Um, there was um, uh, representative values from analysis of multiple projects uh, published in an IPCC report. Uh, and we pulled out numbers for natural gas um, uh, generation, um, utility scale solar photovoltaics, and fixed foundation offshore wind from, from that analysis. And because it was based on a range of projects, there's an upper bound a lower bound value and a median value shown for each of those, um, those uh, technology types. Uh, floating uh, um, uh, foundation or fl floating uh, offshore wind is a, a much newer technology, so there are fewer studies, um, but we um, uh, uh, did find a study that was uh, published uh, just this year um, based on a single project that indicated that um, the expected um, uh, greenhouse gas emissions intensity over the life cycle of the of the of uh, of that sort of project to be very comparable or very similar to fixed foundation offshore wind, and um, uh, um, uh, that's uh, not surprising and, and to be expected. And just as a note, of course, during the operation of of the solar and wind options, um, there aren't. Um, uh, very many emissions. Most of the emissions associated with those technologies are associated with the um, construction or, or uh, materials associated with uh, building those projects. Uh, but they're still uh, all quite, quite low uh, compared to fossil fuel based uh, systems. Um, I think a second note is that offshore wind generation is complementary to other renewable energy technologies. Um, the graph here shows um, a comparison between um, uh, uh, offshore wind uh, at the um, in the Humboldt Call area, which is shown uh, with the uh, the blue line that I'm hi highlighting here, um, and that compares it to land, the average land-based uh, wind uh, here in California and solar power. These are average values over the course of the year um, for it, for each hour of the day, and so you can see what the daily patterns are for each of these uh, technologies on average. And um, offshore wind ends up being relatively consistent in its output um, on average um, compared to some of the other technologies. And of course, provides generation um, uh, frequently uh, at night in a way that, uh, that uh, makes it complementary to solar power in particular. Um, and so a diverse portfolio that includes all of these technologies, I think, uh, is important for 
a, a robust approach to um, or can be a, a part of a robust approach for um, meeting California's goals. Um, I think one final note that I'll make is that including offshore wind in the California grid can help reduce um, the overall amount of energy storage that's required for grid management. When you have a mix of uh, intermittent renewable energy technologies, um, uh, energy storage is, is part of uh, what ends up being important for, for managing the system, including offshore wind can help reduce how much storage is needed. And that has uh, environmental benefits in itself if that storage is based on, on batteries because uh, batteries have, um, uh, have their own environmental impacts primarily associated with uh, mining to obtain the materials uh, for the batteries. So if we were to assume, uh, just as an example, the most common lithium ion technologies that are available today, um, developing uh, 1.8 gigawatts uh, of offshore wind in the Humboldt Call area over uh, several decades could help avoid um, something on the order of 1,000 tons of lithium, 3,700 tons of nickel, 1,100 tons of cobalt, and associated, uh, uh, which means associated environmental damage is being avoided uh, um, in association with, with mining and other, other operations. Now, batteries are a complex topic in themselves, and there are uh, there is quite a bit of research on alternative materials um, and other approaches for, for, uh, for battery development. Um, but uh, regardless of the, the battery technology that's ultimately used, having a, a system that minimizes the, the need for batteries while still being able to move towards a renewable uh, platform uh, is, a, is a good thing. Um, and so that is one of the potential benefits of, of offshore wind. Uh, with that, I will um, uh, close and pass things uh, back over to Sarah, but first wanted to just uh, re-acknowledge our project funders uh, and note um, uh, and give a big thank you to all of the team members, both from the Schott Center elsewhere at Humboldt State and our partners uh, in, uh, in developing this work. Um, so thank you all very much, and I will pass things uh, back to Sarah. Fantastic. Thank you, Arnie. Okay, so we're going to move into our next agenda item now, explore research findings related to the ecological and the geological environment. And Sharon Kramer and Scott Terrell are project researchers with H.T. Harvey. And together, they're going to present results on the ecological and geological characteristics of the North Coast Cull area and considerations related to both marine mammals and seabird habitat. After we hear from Sharon and Scott, we will play a recorded presentation by Mark Hempel Haley, who's a project researcher at the Humboldt State University. And Mark will be sharing through his video information about the geologic and seismic considerations. While Mark is unable to be joining us now to share his research findings, he will be joining us um, in a bit for the community Q&A discussion. So not to worry, um, he'll be able to address questions that you may have at that time. Um, we're not going to pause for questions in between um, Sharon and Scott's tag team presentation with Mark's recorded presentation. So please sit tight. We want to make sure that we can get through sharing information first before we pause very briefly for clarifying questions and then finish up this agenda item with our um, panel discussion. And so one more time, just to remind folks, we will keep the line muted and invite questions via the Q&A and email. So Sharon and Scott, I have you planning to conclude your presentation after about 25 minutes at 3.05. So I will flag you with a five minute mark um, verbally and a one minute mark as needed. And I will hand it over to you now. So please go ahead. And we cannot hear anyone's voice coming through. So just do a double check, Sharon, that you are unmuted. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. And we okay. can see your lovely face. Fantastic. <laughs> um, so I, I won't uh, spend a lot of time with introducing Scott and I. Uh, I am tag teaming this with Scott. And Scott is a, a bird ecologist. And so we're going to run through this presentation. I'll take the first half and hand it over to Scott. So next slide, please. 
I will say I want to thank HSU for um, letting us be on the team and the funding organizations that Arnie pointed out, as well as that we are really excited to be able to share our work with you. So um, that I wanted to mention. So we're going to breeze through a, a series of topics that we covered in our reports today. There's literally 200 plus pages of written material. So it's, you know, in 25 minutes, we can only cover so much. So um, I'm going to talk at the sort of 5,000 foot level, 50,000 foot level, I should say, about sort of the overall report and what we covered and how we did our analysis. And then I'll turn it over to Scott to, to come down to about 5,000 feet and talk more specifically about seabirds uh, and, and the offshore wind uh, feasibility. And then he'll finish up with our key takeaways. And we'll start first with onshore transmission. Um, and I'll, I'll talk a little more about that, but I'll keep it short. And then uh, offshore, we'll spend a little bit more time talking about the offshore component. So next slide, please. Just a quick reminder that um, Arnie mentioned that we have an incredible offshore wind resource map. This offshore wind resource also has biological and ecological implications. But it's important to note if you look off our Humboldt coast that we are in some of the highest wind speeds um, offshore uh, in the country. So that is why there is a, a hard look at offshore wind here. Next slide, please. So again, at the high level, Arnie has presented some of this. We looked at the offshore call area, which is in the green hatch. This is the components of the project. From there, where the wind turbines will be located, there'll be a cable that brings that power that's generated to shore. I'll talk a little bit more about that in detail. And then um, two offshore wind, offshore sea cable, subsea cable options, uh, high voltage DC cables that run down to the Bay Area. I'm actually not going to spend much time on that today because that's uh, uh, in one of our other reports. I want to focus on the offshore call area. And then um, transmission. And I'll talk a little bit more about that um, actually next. And again, um, we're going to try to keep this at a really high level. Um, next slide, please. I did want to mention that there is um, a component, and it'll be our next webinar on the Humboldt um, Bay and port improvements. And I want to say that um, we did look at effects, environmental considerations for that. And that I'll be on a panel in the next webinar to hopefully cover any questions about that. So we'll not talk about that today. As Arnie mentioned, we had some scenarios that we looked at for build out of offshore wind projects. Again, they have different numbers of turbines uh, associated with those power outputs. And of course, because of that, their footprint or their, their, their area that they take up offshore differs in scale. So there's a 50 megawatt footprint. 150 megawatt footprint noted there, it's larger in area, and then the full build out at 1800 megawatts. And there are different numbers of turbines, but we we're talking about 12 megawatt turbines. Uh, so you can do the math and figure that out. And again, uh, from the offshore call area where the turbines are generating power, there'll be a subsea cable that takes that power to shore. And that uh, shore landing is one that we'll talk a little bit about uh, in, in a minute. And then again, the um, uh, the um, export to the grid. And, I'll, and the main point I want to make about that is the major uh, transmission from the offshore call area to the grid in California is going to be for the large scale build out. So the smaller scale build out, smaller uh, uh, megawatt projects areas are going to be um, providing power more locally. So next slide, please. Okay, let's talk about the onshore. Um, our report goes into incredible detail about this, and I'm going to focus today on the east-west uh, um, transmission. And we had to assume, for a variety of reasons, um, that we would follow roughly the same footprint of the existing transmission lines. And the reason for that is that there is a whole procedure, and if you were at the first webinar, there's a whole process for determining uh, whether a project uh, transmission upgrade would be in a similar footprint or a completely different location. Since we had no basis to assume where the, another location would be, we use the existing footprint so that the existing transmission would be upgraded. And I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, again, this transmission upgrade is really uh, necessary if we're going to have the full scale build out because it's more power than, than will be used locally. 
and uh, ideally we would get that power to uh, the load sources which are outside of our area. Um, so in this case, we're looking at a load uh, uh, connecting to the grid somewhere out towards the um, I-5 corridor. Okay, next slide. So when we talk about transmission upgrade, what do we mean? Um, if you see the little wooden pole uh, on the sort of lower left, that would be a good example of what's existing uh, in the transmission corridor that's east to west now. And the large towers would be something more akin to what would be needed to transmit the uh, larger scale build out power generation uh, to the Central Valley. So it just gives you an idea that the, the scale, the size of the towers, the scale, the height, the number of lines uh, differs tremendously, right? So that's the difference between um, upgrading uh, what we currently have to, to, to being able to transmit power uh, to the grid with um, uh, larger scale uh, transmission capabilities. So we looked at the same footprint. Um, but can you go back a slide? Thank you. Real quickly, there are lots of monitoring protocols and methods for doing this kind of thing because think about California. We've had numerous solar projects, numerous onshore wind projects that have to, had to do the same thing. So it's a very monumental task and not trivializing it, but it's very doable. Um, okay, now next slide. Thank you. Really quickly then, at a high level, the construction, operation, and maintenance effects. Because the footprint's bigger, you're going to have uh, some vegetation removal and habitat loss associated with uh, construction and with the, the need to keep vegetation from growing under the footprint of the project. There's noise disturbance during the construction uh, and uh, with the increased number of lines, uh, higher heights, we have a different risk of bird collision with those transmission lines. And of course, quickly, there are uh, impacts to um, obviously associated with ground disturbance activities, including to aquatic systems. And if you looked at that transmission corridor, crosses numerous ridges and numerous water courses. So we have to be careful about that. And then plant communities, and as well as um, once the project is built, uh, the threat, uh, terrestrial invasive plant species are another issue. So there's all kinds of issues with respect to taking the existing corridor and making it more appropriate for transmitting higher power. Okay, I'm going to move on to the next slide and go offshore. So um, the focus of now will, will be offshore. BOEM, Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, which was mentioned earlier, um, has a regulatory framework online that talks about uh, the regulatory uh, permitting pathway, the, actually the leasing pathway. And we're in the first phase, planning and analysis. And then hopefully soon we'll be in the leasing phase. But the thing to, I want to point out is that this whole start to finish process is on the order of multiple years, 10 years, I'll just say that. But it's a long time and there are multiple phases of it. And most of these phases have a public uh, participation phase and um, a review, environmental regulatory review and consultation. So the next slide, and I'm not going to talk much about the next slide. It's a huge amount of I just wanted to show the huge number of uh, permit and review and consultation organizations that are um, responsible for different statutes that include everything from the Endangered Species Act, Clean Water Act, Marine Mammal Protection Act, uh, and all these are layered into that BOEM process. So um, it's not that there does, there is not an arbitrary path set forward that a project will succeed because it has to go through all these regulatory um, hurdles. And I think that's my uh, point in, in discussing this is that there's all these processes take time and that's part of, of what's incorporated into the bone timeline. Next slide, please. So let's talk about the physical setting for offshore. Um, we don't have, uh, we don't have extremely detailed information about the call area per se. And that I'll talk about in a minute. But we know approximately that, that we are bounded by canyons. We've got the Eel River Canyon, we've got uh, the Matoll Canyon, we've got the Triple Junction. We know it's geologically really complex offshore. Um, and so that, that plays into uh, the, what we'd like to know about more. But also within that setting, we have um, other areas that we're concerned about, including the offshore wind, uh, the offshore disposal site for sediment off Eureka. We have um, marine protected areas within California state waters. 
uh, and other regula regulatory concerns like habitat, what's called habitat areas of particular concern, uh, rocky reefs. And so there's a, there's a complexity of habitats offshore not to be overlooked. I want to mention the, the part on the left, the image on the left is some research that was done last fall. So this is new where um, Bohm and NOAA have been looking at the call area with autonomous vehicles and remote operated vehicles. So we're getting, we will have some information. We're not going to start from scratch, but when we did this, our report, we didn't have that information. So I just wanted to mention that. Okay, next slide. So in order to really figure out what the project impacts are, you've got to dissect the project. And so we'll get at stressors and receptors next, but the call area is on the image on the left. And it shows basically that, that we think there are some hard and soft substrates out there. So it's not just a big open sandy or muddy coastline. That all has to be figured out. Um, and then again, there's gonna be a cable route, which we don't know the exact cable route, but there will be a, a cable route that has to be figured out to get that power to shore. And so the image to the right right now shows sort of what a project might look like. The scale is not there. Don't, please don't pay attention to the scale. But in the call areas where the turbines on the floating platforms or floaters, I'll call them floaters, are going to be. And those turbines are interconnected with interarray cables that allow them to take the energy that they generate, move them to an offshore substation. From there, the export cable will take the cable will take the power to shore. So there's a cable landing that happens at shore, and that's probably going to be at the south spit if it occurs. And then um, it'll be horizontally directional drilled under Humboldt Bay. So these are all really important pieces of, of the project that have to be considered because their impacts are different and their timelines are different. And then once at the Humboldt, Humboldt generating station, uh, then into the transmission, into the grid, either the local grid for the smaller scale projects or the larger grid if there's a larger scale project. Next slide. So just an, also those floaters aren't that they're floating around willy nilly, they're moored to the bottom. So um, what we analyzed was um, three point mooring. So for each floater, there would be three mooring lines, three anchors, and those, the composition of the mooring lines, the size of the mooring lines, the anchors and the type of anchors all make a difference. So they all have different effects. So this is just an idea of what it's gonna look like in the water. Okay, next slide. So the in-water project phases, as I mentioned, and this is what's happening in the water. So not all the permitting and not the other things that happen at desktop, but in the water, uh, site assessment and characterization is a key part because you can't even figure out the layout of the project. You can't even figure out the cable route without having information. It's very needed. It also provides a time slot to get some biological and ecological information, what the habitat's like, what species are there. That happens in phase one. So in the water, we're talking about weeks to maybe a few months of in-water work that happens. Phase two is construction. Now we're talking about months to years, depending on the scale of the project. That's where cable laying happens, anchoring, mooring, and getting your devices out there offshore. Phase three is operations and maintenance, or O&M, and that's just the duration. That's when power is being generated by the project. So that's years on the order of 20 years. So we're talking about that being the longest phase. And then phase four is decommissioning. I'm not gonna talk much about that, but it's kind of the opposite of construction. And that's again, months to years, depending on the scale of the project. Next slide. So we've heard stressor receptors, they interact. Stressors are things like the moving blades on the, on the wind turbine themselves. Uh, what is the stressor? You need to define it. How do you measure its frequency, intensity, duration? How, uh, what kind of exposure area does it have? Like how wide of an area does it affect? And that for sound underwater, it travels really far. So the exposure area is very large. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. The receptors are your animals and your habitat. So what habitats are there? Uh, how sensitive are they to threshold, to, to the, the stressor, which are the, thre the thresholds in the next box on the uh, right side? But the receptors, if they're marine mammals, if they're fish, if they are different bird species or bat species, when are they there? How do they use the project area? We have to know all of that. Marry those two sort of pieces together to get at what the potential effects are. And that's how we um, looked at the different scenarios. Okay, next slide. So the interactions for offshore construction um, include everything from disturbing the habitat during cable lay, and I'll have a little image of that in a moment. 
That means that the cable typically in our scenarios are buried for a great length of them. So how that happens and what that means. There are a lot of vessels involved in construction. There's a lot of uh, noise with cable A. I'll touch on that in a minute just to give you a visual. And then just because we got more vessels out there, there's more potential for risk with uh, collisions with wildlife, especially cetaceans. And a lot of the construction activities happen 24-7. Uh, I'll touch on that in a minute, but they, because of that, there's lighting, for example, and things like that we have to consider. So next slide. For those of you that don't know what cable laying is, it's a special vessel, usually requiring dynamic positioning, which is a, kind of a noisy way to operate, but allows them to stay on point, on station, uh, not move, get moved around by wind or currents. And the cable, the image on the upper right is what some what cable looks like. It's not tiny, it's big. Uh, and then the three graphics on the bottom, three images on the bottom are what different types of operations are to bury that cable. You can trench it, you can plow it, but there are different mechanisms for getting that cable buried. And that will happen most likely to minimize impacts between cables and, and say fishing industry or other uh, bottom disturbances. So that cable will be likely buried, at least for a portion of its, of its length. Okay, next slide. So now I'm gonna to shift to the, the turbine. So now we're in operations and maintenance. We've got our turbines out there and it's, they're generating power. And I'm real briefly, you know, there's hard structure. In this case, uh, we've got the turbine blades. We mentioned that earlier, birds, bats. There's collision risk, there's avoidance risk. I won't even go into it because Scott will touch on that in more detail. Uh, we've talked about the cables and the cable lay but cables, once the power is being generated, um, have induced, uh, have electromagnetic fields that, some, that are um, detectable by many different species of animals that have special detectors, sensors for that, sensory receptors for that. So we have EMF, we have noise potentially generated by the turbine itself. We have increased vessel traffic. So there's increased noise and potential for, again, collisions. The hard structure uh, provides habitat for uh, settling organisms like uh, settling invertebrates and that in turn can act like an artificial reef and it can attract species of fish or it can um, uh, result in changes to the bottom that may not uh, that would just be a change in the in the ecosystem itself and the type of habitat going from maybe soft substrate to hard um, and then the floating platform itself provides a place for uh, birds or uh, pinnipeds to roost or haul out or uh, perch or haul out. So there's a change in the ecosystem. There's no doubt we know that. Um, next slide, please. So I touched on all these. I'm not going to go into any of them, but the one thing, if you were paying attention, the graphic was a, a picture, an image of a, a foundation mounted turbine. Well, that is not, if you remember, ours are going to be moored floating platforms. So uh, one other uh, potential effect that I'll steer you to is uh, entanglement. And it's one that we don't have a lot of information on, but are there, we know fishing gear and, and whales, there's entanglement issue on the West Coast. To what extent will, will lost fishing gear potentially interact with the moorings, get hung up on moorings, and then that become an entanglement concern? We don't know. So that's a total unknown. Um, all right, and I think we'll go to the next slide. And this is just, and this is Andrea Copping's work. We're lucky to work. We're lucky to have her as a panelist. Just again, sort of the scale of a humpback whale, just to give you an idea of, of what we're talking about. It's a really tremendous scale of difference in size and that we're kind of used to thinking about. And uh, that Andrea and her group have done a great job of trying to put that into perspective. Uh, there's a link, not, I, I don't see it here, but there's a link on the slide deck. And, uh, it'll take you to that uh, uh, video uh, graphic work that has been done. Okay, next slide. Now I want to turn it over to Scott, and he's going to come down to the 5,000 foot level or lower and talk about um, seabird interactions. Okay, thanks, Sharon. Um, so uh, we're going to focus a little bit on seabird interactions um, uh, due to the fact that it's potential, you know, fairly major issue or potentially anyway, um, over the outer continental shelf of California. Next slide, please. And one of the things that um, 
and uh, sort of enhances that uh, is the um, the location uh, of the the Northern California off uh, Outer Continental Shelf, uh, which is an eastern boundary current. It's one of the uh, areas of, of extremely high ocean pr productivity, um, one of five of those currents. Um, and because of that productivity, it's got a very high abundance of, of seabirds um, contributing to the current um, function in terms of productivity is the topographic diversity, which Sharon mentioned, uh, that causes quite a bit of upwelling. Um, so uh, we have a, a diverse assemblage of, of offshore species. Next slide, please. A lot of these species migrate from the Southern Hemisphere where they breed to take advantage of these, this high productivity. Um, and we get very high numbers of species like city shearwaters, we get high numbers of pink-footed shearwaters, muller shearwaters, et cetera, uh, that actually migrate long distances to, to take advantage of the productivity. Uh, next slide, please. And um, with respect to this, the composition of species that are offshore over the outer continental shelf in the uh, California current, um, there, there are a number of studies that have been done on impacts on birds for offshore wind in the Atlantic. Um, but those uh, largely comprise uh, projects that are near shore, that are foundation, they're foundation wind uh, turbines. And those species, the species, near shore species that have been subject to those studies and analyses are basically different from the species that are found over the outer continental shelf. Now, a lot of those nearshore species studies could be analogous to nearshore uh, uh, projects off the West Coast, but um, there are some significant differences between those species and the species found in pelagic waters uh, over the outer continental shelf. Next slide, please. So we do know that uh, a number of birds that are highly pelagic, shearwaters, petrels, albatrosses, et cetera, actually fly higher um, in high winds. And there's a, a, a very robust data set um, collected by Dave Ainley and others uh, that includes all the species in the California current. Um, and um, there's, that publication is available. But we're also using those data, we're working with the Schatz uh, center uh, on a CEC sponsored project to do a three a three dimensional model that incorporates uh, seabird species composition densities and flight height uh, and modeling modeling that relative to um, uh, the windscape so we can it's a it's a probabilistic risk model based on wind speed flight height and species composition and densities along the entire uh, coast. Next slide, please. And the species I mentioned, the the high the species that fly higher with higher winds, uh, which are very characteristic of the offshore environment uh, in the California current, uh, do what's called dynamic soaring, and uh, basically they tack into the wind um, and rise high um, above their starting point, and tack and drop down and they achieve an overall height gain. Uh, and in, in high winds that, that arc above uh, the starting height can be quite high in some of these species. Next slide, please. Scott, this is Sarah, just doing a quick time check to feel, yep. to yeah, see where you're at. Okay, um, we should be winding up pretty quickly here, okay? okay. Within um, five minutes or so? Yep. Yep. Thank you. Sound good? Carry on, sorry. Thanks. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. All right. So um, the, 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 the risk models, and uh, I know, and David Prexta could probably talk about this a bit, but uh, there are other, BOEM, for example, is, uh, and uh, USGS have been doing risk models. I uh, just talked about the 3D um, windscape risk model. Um, and, uh, but those are probabilistic um, type models. We don't know where there's no baseline data for how these, we call them tube noses or prosolarids, are going to respond to turbines. There, there, there just isn't any data. They may avoid them, they may be indifferent, or they may collide. So 
Next slide, please. So that uncertainty uh, regarding behavior or responses of the species uh, necessitates monitoring. And that monitoring will require detecting potential collision encounters, uh, displacement that occurs. Um, and the remote locations, especially far offshore, uh, really increase the challenges of, of monitoring. Next slide, please. So uh, unique, you know, to, uh, relative to terrestrial facilities, it, you can't uh, do fatality searches below the turbines. Um, Direct observations are difficult and very expensive offshore because, uh, and getting out there can be quite difficult, weather dependent. Uh, boat based surveys are very expensive. Aerial surveys are pretty expensive. Um, so, um, remote monitoring technologies are being developed to try to address these difficulties. Next slide, please. Uh, these include radar, optical, uh, acoustic accelerometers, which detect strikes in the blade. Uh, and um, considerations include, and importantly, platform stability, et cetera. Next slide, please. So we are also engaging in a study of a thermal tracker system being developed by Sherry Matzner of the Pacific Northwest National Lab. Um, and um, this thermal tracker will be deployed uh, out in the Humboldt Call area. And our role will be to help um, validate the thermal tracking uh, with respect to the lowest taxon we can identify. And in addition to the identifying the taxon, it will uh, record passage rates and flight speed in the path. Um, next slide, please. And it's going to be deployed uh, this, in this month and the, I'm sorry, the buoy will be deployed this month and the thermal tracker will be attached to the buoy next, next spring. Okay, next slide, please. So um, the takeaways, the construction impacts on and offshore sh uh, of the whole, the whole project, to shorter term and localized. Operations and maintenance impacts are long-term. There's uncertainty um, and that uncertainty and the environment create uh, some monitoring challenges. Um, and um, for, with respect to the overland transmission lines, uh, those long-term uh, impacts are localized to stretches of existing lines, and uh, there are impacts still to terrestrial and freshwater biota and habitats. Um, but the bottom line, especially with respect to the uncertainties for the offshore effects on some of these high flying birds, uh, are to avoid, if possible, to minimize and mitigate, mitigate residual impacts after avoidance and minimization and to employ monitoring and adaptive management uh, via the monitoring results. Thank you. I think that's it. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Scott and Sharon. Um, I would love to turn it over now to Arnie to play the recorded presentation by Mark, please. Uh, thank you, and I will share that video now. Hello, I'm Mark Hempel Haley. I, along with Eileen Hempel Haley and master's student Wyeth Wunderlich, would like to present an overview of the geologic hazards that may be associated with the Northern California offshore wind study. Areas of consideration in this study are the call area, indicated by the blue set of polygons offshore, uh, the turbine assembly area, which is uh, number one on the map, the transmission cable fall, uh, cable landfall the transmission cable landfall that is number two on the North Spit, Humboldt Bay Generating Plant, which is number three, and then the approximate area of the transmission cable corridor indicated by the line at number four. The hazards that we want to consider here are the strong motion, surface rupture, gas hydrates, liquefaction, submarine landslides, tsunamis, and coast seismic sea level change, and I'll talk about each one of these. The study area is based on literature review of available data. Uh, there was no new data collection done in this period of time. And this is not an attempt to serve as either a proponent or opponent of the project. It's just informational. Uh, one of the first considerations is strong motion. And this is shaking caused by earthquakes. And we have multiple sources that do this in the area. 
One is the Cascadia subduction zone, then the San Andreas Fault, the Gorda Plate, Mendocino Fault, and numerous faults onshore and offshore. The map to the right just gives in a framework of the tectonic setting that we're in. We're at the southern end of the Cascadia subduction zone. The map on the left shows seismicity in the region from 2000 to 2020, uh, magnitude greater than 2.5. In fact, we're in the most seismically active area in the United States except for Alaska. To the right is a map of the magnitude greater than six earthquakes that have occurred since 1960, with the yellow dots indicating magnitude six to six and a half, the orange dots indicating six and a half to 6.9, and the red dots are magnitude seven or greater. And you can see we've had a significant number of large earthquakes in this area in that time period. What are the potential impacts? Well, there's damaging shaking that could happen. Uh, there's also the strong shaking can induce most of the other hazards that are under consideration here. So let's look at each one of these sources. The Cascadia subduction zone is about a thousand kilometers long, extending from Vancouver, Canada to Cape Mendocino. It's capable of producing magnitude 9 plus earthquakes. We know this from geologic evidence up and down the coast. The last event was in 1700 AD, and this is supported not only by the geologic evidence, but this is within the Native American oral history that describes the impacts of the event. The time between earthquakes is approximately 245 to 720 years. This range is due to the um, complexity of understanding the ages up and down the coast. Number two is the San Andreas Fault. The San Andreas Fault extends all the way from Cape Mendocino down to Baja, California. It's produced large historic earthquakes, including uh, 1857 in Southern California, but most notably the 1906 earthquake that extended from Cape Mendocino all the way down to San Juan Batista, um, south of the Bay Area. It's erroneously referred to as the San Francisco earthquake, but it's really the Northern California earthquake. It was a magnitude 7.8, event with large displacements near Shelter Cove, and arguably this is the largest shaking event that has occurred in the Humboldt area in modern history. This map on the right uh, depicts shaking intensity that occurred during the 1906 earthquake due to modeling and other geologic evidence. As you can see, the orange to yellow uh, colors indicate strong to severe shaking, and in the area between Petrolia and Eureka, we exhibited um, very strong to severe shaking. The Gorda Plate is an oceanic plate occurring just west of us in Humboldt County, but it's being subducted beneath us, so it actually extends below us and farther to the east. It's been the source of the most seismicity that we've experienced here in Humboldt County in historic times. It's internally deforming, and as it's breaking up, it produces large earthquakes, including the 1980 magnitude 7 earthquake, the 1992 magnitude 7-1 earthquake, and so on. So it produces large earthquakes. And those earthquakes not only occur to the west of us, but actually occur below us and to the east of us. The Mendocino Fault is an east-west trending fault that extends from uh, Cape Mendocino to the west. And it's produced more than 400 earthquakes greater than magnitude 4.5 since 1960. Fortunately, most of those earthquakes occur farther to the west, so that the impacts tend to be uh, lower uh, than the ones to the east where we're most concerned. Then we have multiple sources of, of earthquakes onshore and offshore that are caused by faults that are sitting above the subduction zone. And those faults extend onshore, which we recognize as the Little Salmon Fault, the Fickle Hill Fault, the Mad River McKinleyville Faults, and so on. But they also extend offshore and occur in the area of, of the study site. So surface rupture can be associated with these large earthquakes. And surface rupture means that the ground surface breaks. And here is a map produced by Hill and all shows the bathymetry, that is the topography on the ocean floor uh, that extends off to the west of us, and also active faults that are associated with the on land and offshore portion of the, this zone of faulting. The orange arrow indicates the location of the mega thrust associated with the Cascadia subduction zone. There is a light blue polygon that you can see here, which is the study area. And as you can see, the study area is just immediately to the east of the Cascadia mega thrust, but it's also transected by faults such as the Little Salmon Fault zone and the Table Bluff Fault that occur through the zone. To the right is a seismic reflection profile that's indicated by the orange line that's sort of north, north, east, south southwest trending. And that profile shows uh, sediments that are deformed offshore 
and also shows ver nearly vertical faults that extend almost to the ground surface. The potential impacts to infrastructure include the ground and ocean bottom displacement and also distortion and folding associated with uh, breaking the surface. Gas hydrates are frozen methane that are formed by proper temperature and pressure conditions of gas methane that then becomes solid. Methane is formed by the decay of biogenic material offshore and it can be destabilized by strong shaking, landsliding, surface rupture, and even climate change. On the right is a map of gas hydrate existence that was produced by two studies in 1980 and 1999. The extent of these hydrates is larger than what appears on the map, but that's the extent of the studies. The entire study area is encompassed by gas hydrates. To the left is a seismic reflection profile that indicates the Gorda plate to the left, and that would be coincident with the Cascadia subduction zone. This deformation zone that occurs between uh, North America and the Gorda plate, and then the presence of the Little Salmon Fault and the Table Bluff Anticline. Now, the narrow, thin layer that sits near the top pointed out by the blue arrow is the zone of gas hydrates. Liquefaction is when water or gas saturated sediments uh, lose their strength and volume due to strong shaking. Now, the potential impacts for that to infrastructure is the loss of foundation support and then displacement. On the left is buildings that were toppled during the Nagata, Japan uh, magnitude 7 and 6 earthquake in 1964 when they lost their foundation support and just fell over. To the right is liquefaction-induced lateral spreading that occurred near Port Canyon on the Lower Yellow River during the 1906 earthquake. Landslides are another hazard we need to consider. Uh, the greatest hazard for this project is from offshore landslides. There aren't very extensive landslide hazards onshore. And this is a bathymetric map from Hill et al. in 2020, uh, much like the one that I showed you earlier showing the cascade uh, megathrust front in the lower part of the image, and then the study area in the lighter colored polygon. And you can see that the red lines in here are the head scarps of failures that occur mainly in the upper reaches of submarine canyons, but there are some that extend through the study area. The potential impacts of these are displacements of ocean sediments and their associated infrastructure. There's of course liquefaction that could occur and these can also produce tsunamis. Tsunamis are produced by earthquakes, volcanic eruptions, submarine landslides, and by onshore landslides. They typically are multiple waves that occur in an oscillatory manner and produce very powerful currents. Potential impacts to infrastructure include flooding, scouring, deposition of debris, and scoured sediments. On the right is a tsunami evacuation map produced by the California Geological Survey and it shows the inundation areas that could be produced by a large magnitude 9 earthquake with a high tide and flood conditions. What you can see here are the circled numbers for some of the facilities. Number one being the, um, the construction site, number two is the cable landfall, and number three is the power generation station. There's even an updated map that you can find by going to the uh, California Geological Survey uh, website shown here. And finally, co-seismic and inter-seismic sea level change. The co-seismic change occurs when earthquakes happen and you get a sudden either uplift or down dropping of coastal areas. These are especially profound in subduction zone settings. To the left is an image of uplift that occurred to the coast following the 1992 magnitude 7.2 earthquake where the seafloor was uplifted about two meters. And to the right, was the magnitude 9 Sumatra earthquake in 2004 that caused subsidence of the seafloor by about two meters. This is a forest stand that existed above sea level that was down dropped into sea level and the trees were actually broken during the tsunami that inundated afterwards. The potential impacts are sudden emergence and submergence of near coastal infrastructure by these. There's also inner seismic change and that is the change that occurs between earthquakes. In the loading cycle of earthquakes, there's a gradual change in relative sea level along a fault. And there's also climate-induced sea level change that's occurring now. So in conclusion, there are significant potential geologic hazards that exist due to our tectonic setting along the Cascadia subduction zone. These hazards will have to be investigated further, and they'll need to be addressed for possible development of an offshore wind farm. Thank you.
Okay, fantastic. We can thank Mark in spirit. Yay, thank you, Mark. And we will talk to him soon. Okay, now I'm going to share my screen. And segue us into the panel discussion after our um, presentations by Sharon, Scott, and Mark. So today we're honored to have five members of our local community and the broader renewable energy community as panelists today to share their thoughts and their reflections about the information that we've just learned from our presenters. These panelists were selected based on their expertise and because they represent a variety of perspectives related to the potential for offshore wind development on California's North Coast. So I would like to welcome Tom Wheeler, the Executive Director from EPIC, David Pereska, avian biologist from the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, Brandon Southall, President and Senior Scientist from Southall Environmental Associates Incorporated, and research, research associate from the University of California, Santa Cruz. Andrea Copping, senior research scientist from the Coastal Division at the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. And Aaron Porter, senior project engineer from the Coastal Division at Mott McDonald. So thank you to all of our panelists for being here today. Um, as a reminder, I will present each one of you with a question and ask that you kindly limit your response to three to four minutes in total. And I will find a suitable place to interrupt if we're running tight on time and we need to move on to the next panelist. So thank you for your understanding. We wanna ensure that we can hear from all of you. Okay, so I'm going to stop sharing the screen so that we can see all of our presenters' faces. And the first question is to Tom Wheeler. Tom, if you would like to turn on your video and um, unmute yourself, your question is, onshore wind energy projects have faced strong opposition in the local community over the last decade. Do you have any insight or advice for navigating to a wind-wind endpoint in the North Coast call area that considers the needs and priorities of diverse stakeholders? That's an excellent question. Um, I think a lot of us are still living through the trauma uh, that was the Terrigen experience. Uh, so those who were project proponents, those who were project opponents, and uh, those of us who fell somewhere in the middle, um, it was a, a, a pretty awful uh, experience. Um, my my first thought is is that um, there is no right way uh, to evaluate a project. We're being kind of asked to. Um, look at uh, uh, apples and oranges here for potential uh, impacts from a project versus potential benefits from a project. I, I would say though that there is a wrong way to evaluate impacts, uh, which is um, I, I experienced during the Terragen experience um, that a lot of people used that to uh, cherry pick evidence uh, to support their pre-existing beliefs and there was a lack of intellectual curiosity um, or willingness to try to evaluate the project from another person's perspective. Uh, so the more that we can do things like this, where we can have a better understanding of each other's perspectives, I think will help um, in the evaluation of this project. Um, I, I think that something else that was difficult about Terrigen was uh, the ownership structure of the project proponent um, and the lack of any sort of democratic um, engagement for the public in shaping that project. Here, because of uh, the hopefully the participation of RCEA, the Harbor District and others, uh, the public should have more opportunities to engage with this project and hopefully shape its final outcome. Uh, so with more democracy, I think that we can um, come to a position where uh, folks will be um, more accepting of the results of the process. And I will end there. Thanks so much. Thank you, Tom. Okay, David, coming to you now, if you'd like to turn on your video and unmute yourself, the question we would love for you to speak to is what data are available on offshore bird populations near the call area and what data gap should be addressed to increase our knowledge of the status and distribution of bird populations in the area? Okay, thanks. 
Yeah, well, there's been um, a number of scientific surveys that have been conducted in the area over the last 30 or 40 years. Um, and there's been some concerns with stakeholders that, well, there's been no work out there, but there's, there's been a number of surveys that have been done. Most recently, BOEM supported a survey of seabirds and marine mammals from Fort Bragg, California to Grays Harbor, Washington, which included broad scale offshore transects that were counting both marine birds and marine mammals. And then sort of uh, higher density focal areas where BOEM believed uh, renewable energy projects might be feasible and where we may see uh, requests for that. And this included an area um, in the waters off Arcata and Eureka. So we've done some surveys recently. And in addition, we've collaborated with NOAA and primarily their biogeography branch and USGS to synthesize all the available data sets from the Eastern Pacific over the last 40 or 50 years. Uh, so basically we're trying to get every scientific data set that's been collected offshore on seabirds and synthesize those into a common database. And then uh, we're now in the process of producing high resolution predictive models of seabird distribution um, in this area. And it's along the entire Pacific coast from uh, Washington, Oregon and California. Um, and then the data gap question, well, we do have a lot of information uh, from transect surveys. There's not a, a huge amount of information on migratory species. Some of those don't get picked up well on surveys, depending when they're done, because uh, migration happens in, in pulses. And, and some of these species are among the more vulnerable um, due to their distribution, flight height, and other factors. So, um, and so some of the, actually the proposed thermal tracking that Scott discussed earlier may address that in part. Perfect. Thank you so much, David. Okay, Brandon, we'll come to you next, please, if you'd like to turn on your video and unmute yourself. The question we have that we'd love for you to address is, can the North Coast offshore wind resource be developed in a manner that is compatible with the existing marine mammal populations? Uh, thank you very much. Um, yes, is the answer. Um, with science, with uh, some thoughtful um, kinds of things. I thought Sharon did a good job of laying out what some of those kinds of disturbances um, are. Um, my exper uh, expertise is in sound, acoustics, how it affects hearing and, and behavior, so I can speak a little bit more uh, directly to that. Um, I think it's important that she highlighted the differences between things uh, in installation and operation. Those present pretty different um, kinds of issues. We do know that, um, you know, things uh, associated with offshore when development can um, disturb um, marine mammals um, from some of the work that's been done in Europe and, and on the East Coast, and we can learn some things from that. Um, but I think we know enough about some of the hearing systems to know that most of the operations are unlikely to cause sort of direct physical harm in terms of hearing. And the bigger issues we have to consider are things associated with disturbance and habitat um, kind of issues. Um, and then the other uh, uh, whole suite of things relate to um, entanglements uh, and direct physical interactions, which, you know, with the, the structures being under tension might not seem as dramatic as things like, you know, nets and traps and, and things that right whales get tangled up in or, or, or humpbacks here in California get tangled up in sometimes. But there are still some issues with entanglement that are, are worth considering. The, the last thing that I'll say is all of those issues really rely on um, knowledge of spatial and temporal distribution of the animals, some of which we don't have on as fine of scales as we might want for some of these things. So in the monitoring um, uh, that's been done around some of these kinds of things, there's things um, related to distribution and timing of, of um, activities re relative to animals that we need to be aware of and, and learn from. And I think the monitoring that's that's required uh, or is done in this should take some of those uncertainties into account and, and be sort of tuned to them. And then the last thing that I'll say is um, we are working with BOEM on the East Coast for some risk assessment uh, ways of thinking about disturbance. Um, that might be relevant considerations for some of this. It's a project that's in kind of the process right now. Um, but some of those things, as opposed to just strictly thresholds, but that are processes that incorporate risk assessment are pretty important um, 
ways of kind of moving forward in a more modern way than just simply uh, thresholds. Thanks. Fantastic. Thank you, Brandon. Okay, would love to hear from Andrea next. So Andrea, if you'd like to turn your camera on and unmute yourself. Do you have additional concerns or uncertainties about environmental impacts that were not mentioned previously by other panelists? Are there potential impacts to the ecosystem, including anadromous fish of local concern, such as salmon and steelhead that should be considered? Go ahead. Yeah, thanks so much. Actually, I think Sharon and Scott did a really great job covering the issues broadly. I was especially pleased to see the focus on flight height for offshore seabirds because we felt that was a real missing piece. A lot of what they covered, I think really um, we understand well enough we can mitigate for, but we'll continue to study. But as far as fish and fisheries are concerned, it's always an issue that's raised. The good news is with floating offshore wind turbines, we don't have the same kind of impacts we'd have from bottom-based turbines, from pile driving, all the extra vessels, the sound, et cetera. But some of the issues that are raised, um, electromagnetic fields, potential from special cables draped in the water column between uh, platforms. Um, there's also some other issues raised I want to touch on that I don't think are a big deal. Um, and that includes reefing of fish. It also includes a sort of uh, introduction of non-native species. But as far as the uh, electromagnetic fields, we took a look at these uh, cables that would be draped from platform to platform carrying um, 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 power. And there are electromagnetic, particularly magnetic emissions. But when we modeled those, thinking about the kind of power that would be carried, we found that the um, field died away really very quickly within the first half to one meter. So that if we think of anadromous fish like um, uh, salmon or steelhead, they're likely to be um, swimming fairly high up in the water column, so perhaps in the area where these cables are. But we, we think that the die-off to background EMF is really fast. So you'd have to have fish that would come and really hang around these cables for a long period of time if you in, uh, considered there'd be damage to them. And we think that's pretty unlikely. Um, there's been issues raised um, around uh, what if all the endangered species came and reefed around the platform? They all just came and hung out th there. The scenario that is fun is then the big uh, predator comes around and wipes the whole population out. This is extremely speculative and we have no real reason to think this is an issue. Otherwise, reefing of fish really doesn't put them in danger. They just hang out looking for food or shelter. The other one that's raised is if we have these platforms out there, we have new hard bottom habitat, will we allow sort of a stepping stone effect for non-native species, which could um, affect um, fish fisheries of the whole ecosystem? And this has been examined in Europe a couple of times, and so far there are no data sets that indicate this is the case. So there are some open questions, but generally speaking, particularly with the floating turbines, we think that the anadromous fish are really not very much at risk. It needs to be sort of uh, scenarioed out, gamed out, and exactly what Brendan was just talking about for the marine mammals, we need to look at these risk profiles, what could be happening. When we look at the cables that are down on the bottom, they are generally buried, separating fish, the bottom fish from the, from the effects. So we're not finding much in the way of anadromous fish risk. Here. Fantastic. Thank you, Andrea. Okay, so coming to our last um, panelist for his remarks, um, coming to you, Aaron, if you'd like to turn on your video and unmute yourself. Uh, Dr. Hempel Haley outlined a number of geologic and seismic hazards for the North Coast region. In your view, what is the significance of these hazards for offshore wind farms, including both offshore infrastructure, like floating platform anchors and undersea cables, and onshore infrastructure, such as cable landfall installations, electrical substations and transmission lines, and port infrastructure. Yeah, no, thank you. And I think Mark did a great job outlining uh, those hazards. I think we sort of see it in sort of three different areas um, going from offshore, uh, onshore, the, the offshore portion, the ocean coast, and then the bayfront as well. Um, in terms of the anchors, um, you know, the seismic motion needs to be incorporated into design of those anchors. Um, as Mark noted, there's some, some risk for some marine landslides within the call areas that need to be assessed in terms of uh, spatial planning and displacement. 
um, and then embedment could potentially destabilize those those gas hydrates and sediments. So it's a little more investigations needed there to incorporate that into planning of the wind farm. Um, on the subsea transmission cable side, so that's either connecting the, exp the, the wind farm to the coastline or the um, longer distance subsea transmission cable that um, had been discussed earlier down to San Francisco Bay. And we looked at both the constraints and the hazards there at a pretty high level. Um, and some of the hazards there to be considered are those submarine canyons and landslides. Uh, globally, submarine landslides are one of the main reasons for cable faults uh, worldwide. Um, so those would need to be investigated a little more in a little more detail going forward um, and making sure those are avoided on the route. Um, seismic faults could also be an issue um, where the, the magnitude of displacement could end up rupturing the cable. Um, it's potentially um, needed to plan for, for major or for repairs after major events going forward. Um, but neither, uh, I guess the hazards that we've seen so far don't necessarily preclude feasibility uh, for either floating wind anchors or a subsea transmission cable. Um, just need to be investigated in a little more detail and, and plan for that. Um, on the ocean coast, um, we've got the landfall where the cable comes ashore. Um, and that's looking at you know, potentially scour to, due, to the, due to the tsunami um, or other co-seismic change or land, land level change. Um, neither of those appear to be likely to preclude feasibility of, of landfall, um, but we need to be incorporated in design and assessment of, of those landfalls. Um, whether it's or, whether it's a, an HDD or a, meaning a sort of a, a horizontal drill or an open cut. Um, on the bayfront, um, we did conduct sort of an initial vulnerability assessment for these different hazards. Um, we're done that in coordination with with the Humboldt team. Uh, on the port side, yeah, the, there's likely to be inundation uh, due to tsunami in the port area. The the port is necessarily on the water. Um, and as, as Mark showed in the inundation maps in that area. Um, so there's potentially some design considerations to be taken into account for resiliency post inundation, um, as well as sea level rise considerations um, and sort of how the port wants to be, uh, what, those, what those resiliency levels are post event um, can be incorporated into design. Um, and then in terms of seismic shaking, there's there's still assume, there still appears to be a, a number of different structure options for a new wharf if, if needed um, at the site um, and can likely be designed for. So probably not precluding development there. Um, so an important consideration, but not precluding feasibility. And in terms of the substation or transmission infrastructure. Um, there's going to be some considerations for site assessment and site placement of those kinds of infrastructure. Um, you know, understanding inundation depth and risk and what kind of design details and um, structure geometry is incorporated into those designs and whether it's, you know, further down on the coast, down the bay, or further up uh, out of the inundation area. Um, it might be more upland than, than existing going forward for some of these larger land-based um, substation or converter station type type pieces of infrastructure. So I think sort of on the whole, there's there is you know, a number of considerations. Um, we don't see it fully precluding feasibility going forward for a number of either whether you're looking at offshore on the coast or, or on the bayfront, just just a little bit more planning and assessment and analysis. Great. Thank you so much, Aaron. So thank you to actually all of our panelists. Um, for providing your first impressions. We've had a number of questions come in through the Q&A chat and the email, and so we will head there um, momentarily. So our goal really thus far has been to share information to help, you know, increase the understanding and the knowledge of offshore wind technology, and specifically the ecological and the geological environment. And so where we're headed now is into the community Q&A and the discussion where we would like to hear from the SHOT Center, OPC, um, and all the folks that have provided uh, presentations, opening remarks, and um, panelists' responses to respond to the questions that we've been getting throughout this time. And so I'm glad to see that Mark um, has, Mark Hempel Haley has joined us. So he is here, which is fantastic. Um, we have some questions for you. And just a reminder that we do have local and non-local folks you know, on the webinar today and 
people with different expertise and experience related to offshore wind somehow. And so we really want to hear from, you know, a diversity of voices in today's conversation. And we'll do our best to, um, to, to ask panelists and presenters to speak to the questions that are most appropriate um, for the questions that we received. I also want to remind you just very quickly that, again, as folks start to make their way um, into other commitments for the day, we are going to drop that Google Form survey into the chat, and we would love for you to fill that out and share your feedback as you're comfortable. So that has just been dropped. Okay, fantastic. So I'm going to move over to the questions that we've received so far. The first question is from um, Pat, and the question is, is this video of Mark's available for review as a standalone? And so thank you for asking that question. And yes, a reminder that the webinar itself will be recorded. Um, we can also make that geological video, the presentation by Mark, avail available separately as well on the Shot Center website. So visit shotcenter.org slash wind for the latest recordings and reports. Okay, we have a question from Jordan to Sharon. Were underground transmission lines considered onshore or overhead only? The, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Okay, good. <laughs> yeah. So uh, the onshore transmission was overhead. The, um, the transmission from the call area to Humboldt Generating Station was considered to be buried slash underground, whatever you want to call it. But uh, yeah, it would be buried. So that was the, that's a distinction. I don't think that for the overland route, it's probably not possible to put that much uh, transmission underground. Um, but I'm not a transmission expert, but that's what we analyze. Okay, thank you, Sharon. Okay, we have a question from Roland. Recent research has shown that if one blade of a turbine is painted black, a lot fewer birds are killed by the turbine. Will this be required for wind farms off the California coast? So when I invite any of our panelists and presenters to um, respond and others can build upon that response. Um, I'd be happy to start that one off. Um, uh, before be Andrea. Sarah, because uh, these are colleagues of mine in, in Norway that did this work and it's been an ongoing project for six or eight years. This is a smallish wind farm in northern um, Norway. It's Schmöle is the name of it. There's a series of turbines that are right along the edge of the shore on an island. They're not actually offshore. They're right on the edge of the shore. So they may have some pertinence to the offshore. And the bird of concern in particular was the white-tailed eagle. And they also, the ptarmigans, you guys know those little things that run along the ground. Those things kept running into the into the towers themselves. So they tried painting the uh, towers in a black and white checkerboard uh, pattern. And they actually, fewer of these little birds ran into it running along. So that, that sort of gave them the idea of trying to look at painting the turbine blades. And they did find over this six year study that they were seeing a significant drop in uh, white-tailed eagles hit by the turbines that had this one black blade. It's a fabulous study. Um, I'd encourage you all to read the paper. Um, but I think it's really important to note that this is one species of, of rat, large raptor. These things are a little bit bigger than bald eagles or around the same size in one location, one particular sort of ecosystem set. And I think what it does is really give us some interesting ideas of how to examine some uh, mitigations, but it can, really needs to be kept in context until this is replicated elsewhere with other species. These are also not tremendously big turbines. They're not nearly as big as the ones we are likely to put offshore. So really interesting, any of these kinds of um, clever but simple and inexpensive mitigation processes need to be examined, but they do need to be kept in context. And I'd like to add on to this. This is Gary from National Audubon. And uh, I'm on the board of the American Wind and Wildlife Institute, which is a collaboration between the industry and conservation NGOs. And our scientists are taking this on to look at how we might replicate this in the United States of America to see how it would work in the United States and what kind of funding that would take. So there's a little bit of motion on that. Um, it won't happen tomorrow and the study would take a few years, so it's not, it's not going to be ready immediately, but I do want everybody to know there is 
some interest in replicating that study in the US. Um, I would love to touch on this too. Uh, things like this um, really emphasize for me the importance of adaptive management and the inclusion of, of adaptive management provisions within whatever sort of um, uh, approval structure uh, for this project. Um, we are honestly still in the early stages of wind energy development, both onshore and especially here offshore. So we're going to learn a lot in the next couple of years about uh, risks, impacts, and ways to reduce those impacts. So ensuring that adaptive management is part of the project and that we have well-defined thresholds of when, um, when we need to include an, an additional mitigation measure is going to be important. And I think that that would help to reduce some of the concerns from um, some of the environmental community that is particularly concerned about impacts of biodiversity. I think that inclusion of those adaptive management measures is going to go a, a long ways. Okay, thank you to those three. Any other folks wanting to add on to this question? Okay. Um, also wanted to mention Gary had asked us to help say out loud as a reminder that he had inadvertently didn't mention um, Magellan Wind as a colleague in power and he just wanted to make that acknowledgement out loud. So thank you, Gary. And moving to our next question. This is for Aaron from um, an anonymous attendee. How exciting. Geohazards of the North Coast are significant. For example, earthquake potential based on proximity to the triple junction. Is floating offshore wind turbine technology currently robust enough to survive a seven plus quake or do you anticipate new technology will need to be developed to overcome this challenge? Sure, so uh, Arnie, you can help me with this one if you'd like. Um, I guess personally, I'm not, you know, I'm a coastal engineer, so I'm not developing the, the devices themselves and the mooring technology associated with that. Um, but I think some of the studies that we reviewed as part of this assessment indicated you know, there are some challenges there, but some of the different anchoring types and mooring strategies need to be developed in a little more um, detail to accommodate those those kinds of motions, um, similar for the transmission cable challenges. But um, we're not yet at that level of detail, um, but I think that we've identified those as some of the, some of the challenges going forward and, and, and uh, I guess elements to refine refine further. Arnie, I don't know if you wanted to add to that. Um, I don't really have that much more to add. I agree that um, um, I don't have particular expertise in in the geotech dimension of that either. Uh, and it's my understanding that that there is additional work that's needed to to understand that fully, especially around the, the anchoring uh, approaches. Um, but if any of the other um, panelists has has something to add to that. Um, uh, I would welcome that. Okay, thank you both. A question from Larry to Sharon and Scott. Did you look at the potential impact to birds from the import dockside assembly of the wind turbines? Um, yeah, this is Sharon. Hi, we did. Um, and the port, again, we just skimmed over the whole port side of it because of um, next week's webinar, actually, that uh, Aaron will be, I think, presenting at on the port side of it. But yeah, they're definitely, while their uh, turbines and are being mounted to the platforms, et cetera, they're not going to be instantaneously hauled out to the, the call area. So they'll be sitting there at port for a while. And yeah, there are birds, a whole different suite of bird species that will be um, susceptible to potential collision, et cetera, from the turbines while they're sitting at port. So yes, we did analyze that. And while I have you speaking, Sharon, another question for, for Sharon or Scott from Hannah Rose. For the 3D risk model for birds, how many taxa or species will be assessed? I think I'm going to let Scott answer that one. Yeah, um, Hannah, we have it's uh, data sets from uh, a number of cruises over about a 20 year period. 
at uh, David Ainley headed up and we have data on all of the species in the California current from the near shore environment out to the to you know 2000 fathoms plus so we should we have a, a robust data set okay thank you both um, a question from Bill to um, any of the panelists how do you see the impact shown for benthic disturbances for a fixed turbine? Sorry, let me start again. How do you see the impact shown for benthic disturbances for a fixed turbine will be different for floating turbines? I can, I can start that. Oh, Andrea, are you gonna jump in there? I you or I, I think we're before. gonna say the same thing, Sharon. <laughs> Go ahead, Andrea, I'll let you take um, it. <laughs> all I was gonna say is with the fixed bottom turbines, one of the concerns, both from an engineering point of view and obviously a habitat disturbance, is you've got this thing stuck in the bottom, you've got bottom currents, you've got disturbances, so you may get scour and you may actually scour areas around the turbine, you may change habitats for some distance from the turbine, which is why they do things like they put what they call um, mattresses down, which are really big cement blocks to try to stop this. Now, when you think about the floating turbines, what you have is uh, anchors, usually embedment anchors down in the bottom and then lines up to the um, platform. Uh, embedment anchors and these kinds of marine um, uh, equipment are very well known. We've used these for everything from anchoring ships to uh, uh, buoys to, uh, you know, uh, oil rigs, et cetera, et cetera. And we know how to put these in with minimum scour and minimum um, sort of disruption even when we put them in. So, uh, and, and also it's important to note that these floating turbines are likely to be in very deep water. So you are in most cases, even in the California current, you have less water movement along the bottom than you would have in say 20 meters off the Atlantic coast or elsewhere. So we think other than the actual footprint, when you put the anchor in, you do some disturbing and so on, there's really relatively little disturbance of the soft bottom habitat, therefore the benthic organisms. And you don't necessarily, depending on what you use on the bottom, create new hard bottom habitat. So we think that the benthic effects can be really very minimal for the floating turbines. What do you say, Sharon? Yeah, I would just, I think it's um, add again, you said it, but people need to rem remember that, that most of the foundation turbines are in much shallower water. So you get growth of organisms on that, uh, that, are, that need the light, you know, to photosynthesize and so on and so forth. So you're gonna have a lot of different organisms that are settling on those columns than you will on the mooring lines uh, for a deep water offshore turbine. And, and you mentioned oil and gas. I mean, all the deep water oil and gas rigs in the Gulf of Mexico, for example, and there are a lot of them, uh, this is the kind of anchoring and mooring that, that they use. So Andrea is spot on about that. We do have information, so. Uh, maybe I could just add to that. Sharon's absolutely right. When you see these um, uh, bottom-based turbines in uh, 30 meters or less water generally around the world, you get this tremendous growth on them, obviously, and then you get growth falling off. And there's been some studies in the North Sea that has really seen how much the bottom has changed right around these turbines, just from this sort of new ecosystem being created of stuff falling from above that wouldn't necessarily have been there. And that's not gonna happen with the floating ones. Sarah, this is Brandon. Can I add something? Please go for it. Yeah, and just the differences between the uh, East Coast and, and uh, uh, Europe structures that are anchored in the bottom with these really large turbines and the kinds of anchors that would be used for um, the floating turbines are really pretty different in terms of the installation kind of effects, the pile driving associated with, you know, 10 meter or greater piles deep into the bottom are much more intense than probably the kind of acoustic signals that'll be associated with the installation of these other anchors. So that's an important difference. Um, but as I mentioned, the entanglement kind of issues with these more, you know, cables in the water from the floating ones are, are it's just a different kind of um, consideration. The other thing that I, I kind of meant to say before is, um, as this 
technology emerges um, and, and is, is kind of implemented, there may be some new kinds of um, sound uh, systems that, that may come into play. I haven't really heard a whole lot about it, but things like undersea um, communication kind of signals, um, encoded signals for things like modems and stuff like that. Um, and we just have to be careful to not just think about how loud things are. So that the actual the vessels and the you know the laying of those those um, footprints uh, or those foundations, which again are not going to be as intense as pile driving of these big huge um, you know structures that go in the ground, but these other kinds of signals can be for certain species they could be important. So the kind of novel signals um, that may go along with it are just things we want to be aware of, even if they're not necessarily loud, they may be novel in ways that could be important. Okay, thank you to the three of you. Um, so we have a comment that's come in through the Q&A. Comments are also welcome, not just questions. So the, question, or the comment is from Peter. It seems to me that your first webinar was an unadulterated sales pitch for the wonderfulness of offshore wind power. This webinar, I think, was a much better balance. There was a lot of hard specific information about birds and the concerns about earthquakes, et cetera. However, when it got to your panelists, there was a lot of loose talk about fish, marine mammals, and fisheries with no foundation in studies. I also don't understand how the panelists were chosen or how the specific questions which were asked were formulated. I hope in the future when there is a discussion of fisheries, essential fish habitat, and the potential changes in ocean ecology, there will be a better basis for the statements made. So I welcome um, the project team to provide a response if you would like to do so now, and we can certainly follow up and be responsive to this comment moving forward. And also welcome the panelists to um, speak to any data sources or information if you would like to share that at this time. And thank um, you, Peter, for your Sharon. comment. Yeah, this is Sharon. I definitely would like to encourage Peter and others to go to our report because it just, you know, 200 plus pages of written material condensed into a 25 minute um, talk which just doesn't do it justice. And we got into the essential fish habitat and, and much more detail in the report. So I encourage you to, to look at that and the apologies that we did skim over that <laughs> quickly in this presentation. And I'd also, Sarah, I'd like to, to add that if you want to go to tethys.pnnl.gov, T-E-T-H-Y-S.pnnl.gov, you will find extensive literature on marine mammals, fish, et cetera, on the wind side of things. A lot of the work initially was done in Europe, um, and, but it's beginning to emerge now from the East Coast as well. And you will find some of the remarks I made about fish, anadromous fish. We worked on an offshore with the developer uh, sort of the first one on an offshore wind project that was uh, slated for Southern uh, Oregon. It never went forward for financial reasons, but we did examine in great detail the anadromous fish as well as many of these others. So um, again, I agree with Sharon, there just isn't time to get into all this, but there is a lot of literature and there is a lot of examination of this that has gone on. And uh, this is Arnie. I'll just uh, add a, a comment or a note. Um, uh, th thanks, Peter, for the comment. In terms of the, the first webinar versus uh, the subsequent webinars, um, the, the first webinar really was intended to describe the opportunity associated with uh, offshore wind development. And um, uh, in some ways, the second, third, and fourth sessions are uh, intended to um, uh, try and understand challenges and and additional issues uh, associated with that. So in some senses, the, the fact that the first webinar um, was focused primarily on uh, on the opportunity and uh, was was deliberate. It wasn't meant to be a sales pitch as much as a way of providing information about the positive dimensions of of that opportunity, although we also did, note the, the challenge associated, especially with transmission. And these additional sessions, um, uh, e each one is going to present a different aspect uh, that, that involves uh, challenges uh, for, for trying to understand stand the issue. Um, I think if this were done in a single all-day workshop, it would feel uh, um, 
it, it a bit different in terms of all of those things being together. The, the fact that they're spaced out by a week maybe gives a different feel to them. But really, our thought is, is that uh, all of this in, information is intended to be considered uh, together and as part of one, one uh, coherent look at, uh, at the issue. Okay, thanks, Arnie. Um, a follow-up question for you, Arnie, while we still have you. Um, are there plans, well, sorry, we still have you till 4.30. I just meant your voice in this moment. Are there plans at this point to help facilitate community engagement throughout the development of this project? And if so, what do they look like? And this is a question from Lindsay. Um, uh, so uh, um, I think, yes, there will be that, but it's, it's not necessarily us who will be uh, doing that. We're, we're of course, um, uh, uh, doing uh, this set of studies and we have some additional follow-on studies that we'll be doing and our role in all of this is to report out on on this work and to try and provide information about both the opportunity and the challenges associated with with the offshore wind um, once and, and of course at this stage there is no actual project um, where th there is a, a defined call area and the potential for a lease auction um, or an expected lease auction, um, but there's there's no um, there's no project, no lease has been issued, and there's no uh, developer. I think um, if things proceed and and a project is to be developed, um, the the um, uh, some of the work associated with that engagement would would take place on the part of both the the um, government agencies that are associated with the permitting processes, as well as the developer themselves in terms of, of, uh, of that engagement. Um, we would be happy to be a part of those processes, but we're, we're not uh, in charge of any of that. Uh, and, and so we'll do our best to facilitate to the degree that we're uh, um, conducting um, uh, analysis to, to um, push that information out in a way that um, a variety of different inter interested parties can have access to it. Um, and we believe very strongly that um, that kind of public engagement is, uh, is, is quite important, but we're not the ones who, who are at the center of that. Um, there are um, some representatives from agencies on, on the line if, if anyone's interested to, to add comments in, in relationship to that. Thanks, Arnie. Um, a follow-up question, I think, that is related to this general question about engagement. Um, are there any Native American or First Nation panelists that are planned for the remainder of the webinar series? Would love your guidance, Arnie. I, uh, uh, you you're on mute. Yeah. Can, can you repeat that question? Yes. Are there any plans to have Native American or First Nation panelists for the remainder of the webinar? Um, we uh, so yes, um, uh, we have had um, uh, in the first webinar there was a, a, a representative from the Blue Lake Rancheria tribe, and there um, uh, are some additional panelists who have been invited um, uh, uh, for subsequent sessions uh, as well, representing tribal governments. Thanks, Arnie. Okay, we have um, an anonymous email and directed to Dave and Sharon. How are the environmental effects considered during the development and permitting process? What is the process for approving offshore wind development? Want me to start, Sharon, or you want to take a crack? Okay. Um, well, we have and I'm bringing up a, a cheat sheet in front of me here, but we have BOEM has a, a competitive leasing process, which takes a number of years um, to complete. And, you know, even now we still haven't um, put out a request uh, for a lease. Well, we've done the area identification, but we haven't issued a lease yet. Um, once a lease is granted, then a developer has to submit a site assessment plan. We then have a period of site assessment and surveys that are done, which can take uh, up to about five years, three to five years. Um, and then once BOEM deems that uh, construction and operations plan is complete, 
then we do our environmental and technical reviews at that point. So we do a, a brief one for the, um, after the lease issuance, or actually maybe before lease issuance for the site assessment plan and assessing whether the surveys and, and those activities will have any impacts. And then we do one later in the process, which would be five, six years from now on um, the other uh, potential environmental effects of the operation of a wind farm. Yeah, I'll just add to that, that um, at, while BOEM is going through its process, there's the National Environmental Policy Act, which you know, opens up a opportunity for public input. And also during that time, as they go through the steps, uh, I showed the four steps in the slide of the BOEM process, there's multiple agencies and consultations and reviews and other permits that need to have to happen in co coordination with BOEM and as a lead agency. And so that, you know, includes everything from uh, Coastal Commission to, you know, again, uh, Marine Mammal Protection Act, Endangered Species Act, uh, Magnuson-Stevenson Fisheries Conservation Act. So all the, all these issues get scrutinized very closely. Um, and that happens through the whole process. So every step <laughs> it has that process occurring. So there's a, a, a very uh, hard look at environmental effects. I want to jump in really quickly um, and say that uh, to the extent that there are uh, BOEM people present or project or potential project proponents present, um, that uh, there are opportunities for public participation through NEPA, uh, through some of our federal environmental laws, uh, that these should always be treated as um, the minimum and not, not the max, right? Um, that more public participation is always better. And I think that this webinar series is the start, hopefully, of uh, greater public participation in uh, reviewing this project or projects. And, and BOEM has already had several stakeholder engagements up on the North Coast. And yeah, we've certainly been up there and, and had a presence and have been listening to people and have been you know, responding to that accordingly. So. Thank you. We have a follow-up question um, for the three of you. Um, maybe Dave can get us started. What's the timeline for release of BOEM's West Coast Pacific Seabird Synthesis models? We're excited to have access to these data to use in other OPC-funded offshore wind work. And it looks like there was a response um, shared via the chat with, with all participants. Happy to connect One with the Redwood second. Regional. I'm so sorry to interrupt. I was pairing the wrong question. So please just continue with the original question you asked and the one that I will do, I'll, I'll put that somewhere else. That was my mistake. Fantastic. Okay, not a problem. So the question, just to be clear, is what is the timeline for release of BOEM's West Coast Pacific Seabird Synthesis Models? We're hoping to have that done by the end of the calendar year. I'm supposed to get a draft of that to review sometime soon. It's a little bit uh, running a little bit behind the schedule of what we had just set recently, but we're hoping by the end of the year, beginning of next year, calendar year, to have that wrapped up and available for the public. Perfect. Thank you, Dave. And it might be helpful for our participants. Could you just clarify, you know, who or what BOEM is for everyone on this call today? Oh, sure. So, yeah, I work for the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management. So we're the Department of Interior Agency that is responsible for energy development in, um, or for the, the review and, and the leasing of areas for offshore energy development in federal waters. So from three miles offshore to 200 miles offshore. And that includes like the existing oil and gas program in Southern California, as well as uh, this potential for renewable energy offshore here in um, California, Oregon, Washington, and, and in Hawaii as well for our office here in the Pacific. Thank you so much, David. Okay, we have a question for um, Mark Hempel-Haley from Daniel. The only thing that scares me more than the chart of bureaucratic agencies that could kill the project is the earthquake maps that could kill the project. But climate change scares me more than either of those. So is the 4% of California's electricity that offshore wind could offer simply an enticing illusion? Um, 
let's see, I'm getting my video here. Uh, that's, that's actually not a question I can answer. <laughs> I can, I'm, I'm a geologist, so I, I can't answer the um, question of, you know, the economic value of this or what it's going to supplant as far as that. I can just say that the possibility of earthquakes um, in this area are, it's a high probability that it'll happen in the lifetime of the area. Um, and it could be larger than magnitude seven. So that has to be uh, put into consideration on any design of, of this scale. Yeah, and no, I can add to that too. Um, you know, as part of this study, it was to identify hazards that might be a risk um, and initial assessment of sort of the severity of those risks that might occur. Um, and so a number of those we identified that, you know, do need more assessment um, for development in a certain area or in a certain method. Um, and I think those are going to be studied in more detail on, you know, what are the um, construction methods associated with that or what are the technologies needed for that maybe might need to be developed to address those, those hazards or you know, mitigation plans or repair plans going forward. Fantastic, thank you. Um, a question to Scott from an anonymous attendee. Scott, your presentation focused on the potential collision risk of seabirds from offshore wind energy infrastructure. The majority of the existing research on seabirds and offshore wind energy infrastructure have found that most seabird species actively avoid the wind development areas, indicating that displacement is a greater risk than collision. Could you please speak to this? Yeah, thanks. No, that's a, that's a, a great question. Um, so we did mention displacement a couple of times, but um, a couple of things. One is the studies that have been done in the Atlantic um, on the nearshore environment that um, involve primarily nearshore birds that are associated with shallow water. And for them to be forced out of that shallow zone is probably more of a potential impact than um, out in a, uh, in a pelagic environment where your, your depth and a lot of your oceanographic and, and other features are really similar across a fairly large area. Um, but the other reason is that displacement has been identified uh, in near shore, on nearshore projects. And um, I thought it was important to, with the time I had, to emphasize what we really don't know about the suite of birds uh, in the outer continental shelf off California that haven't been studied and how they might respond. Um, so that's why the emphasis was, was on that aspect. But um, displacement is certainly something that will be looked at. We have a follow-up question from David um, that I think you can speak to, Scott. Is there any indication that birds will adjust their migratory patterns to avoid large objects, such as icebergs and offshore wind turbines? Um, yeah, well, the studies in Europe have you know, indicated that um, the birds will shift uh, to go around the projects. Um, I don't know of any evidence that indicates that there's a fundamental change in the migratory routes. Um, but that could be a cumulative issue if you have a series of, for example, of, of wind resource uh, development uh, along a, a coastal area. Um, so that's something to think about also. Sarah, this is Brandon. Can I just add something? It's it's not on the bird question, but there's relevant um, considerations along those lines for marine mammals as well. And just to mention some of the science that we do have, you know, it is a short time to kind of get into some of the details, but we know that animals like harbor porpoises may be much more likely to avoid areas where there are installations than other species like gray whales that may get really acclimated. So not to get into it in too much detail, but there's pretty extensive science behind some of that. Some of it is in a new area and, and there are some new species, but um, that habitat issue to the extent to which animals would just avoid areas or continue to use them and, and face some of these you know, direct interactions is species dependent um, for marine mammals um, as well. And animals like harbor porpoises um, might be 
you know, more likely to kind of avoid um, some or other kinds of porpoises may be more likely to just avoid areas. Thank you both. And we have a follow up question um, for you, Brandon, as well as Andrea uh, from Michael. Is there any evidence that electromagnetic fields in electrical distribution arrays interfere with navigation or electroreception sensitivity? Interfering, interfering with the ampullae of Lorenzini and elasmobranchs, for example. Yeah, I'd be happy to address that. Yeah, there's been a number of studies of looking at um, EMF effects on a broad, broad range of animals. It's important to note there's only certain marine animals that have the sensory capability to, to sense electromagnetic fields. So that's really the group we need to focus on. Certain elasmobranchs, that's the sharks, rays, skates, have this capabilities in some of the sharks is these ampullae of uh, Lorenzini, um, but there are other mechanisms as well. That's just one of the indicators. Those guys probably can note them. There's a series of um, invertebrates. Many of the crabs and lobsters and so on can, not all species, but certain ones, certain fish, etc. We did a lot of work in my lab, in the laboratory, exposing uh, them to uh, different life stages of fish invertebrates, et cetera. We did not deal with the big elasmobranchs, um, but those, some of that work's been done in Florida as well. There's been some work done in the field um, in, in sort of microcosms trying to get at this as well. And, and then there's been sort of field observations. BOEM has, has uh, sponsored a number of these studies looking at whether animals will cross uh, energized cables, et cetera, et cetera. It's really hard work to do both in the lab and the field to get um, uh, consistent answers. What we know is that there is some um, evidence of developmental changes, um, behavioral changes for sure, and uh, we're not really sure about others, but those are the physiological, behavioral, uh, uh, some developmental. Um, so a lot of it really depends on how much of a, a power signal you're looking at, et cetera, et cetera. Again, I would refer you to TETHIS, search for EMF, and you'll find a whole series of studies. Unfortunately, an awful lot of them are sort of the lab rats of fish, freshwater fish that are studied in the lab, and they may not tell you a lot. Um, overall, we believe the real issue is, uh, first of all, can you isolate from the animal, which is what burial of cable is about. If you cannot, it's really a matter of saying what are the potential animals at risk or in the vicinity? Are they at risk because they have the capabilities? And what levels of uh, power being put out as EMF, how does that compare to what we know of those animals from other sort of challenge experiments? But, but there is a lot of literature being, being spun out these days. Okay, thank you. So I'm going to um, move to our last question before we wrap up today's webinar with some next steps. So as we finish today, what projects and reports should we, we, should we be looking forward to in the coming year? And what next steps are you hoping to see from state and federal agencies? And perhaps um, Arnie can take a first pass at this. Um, sure, Thank, thanks, Sarah. Um, so I guess there's a, a few different layers there in terms of um, additional work coming out. So first, um, we've posted uh, uh, um, a number of reports from our current study on the SHOT Center website. There's some additional studies that aren't yet available, but which we expect to be available over the next few weeks. Um, they're, they're associated with this work and they're, they're essentially done, but uh, there's, there's a few final things that we're doing to before making them uh, them available. So over the coming weeks, there will be uh, some additional work there um, that, that will become available. I think second is that um, uh, our team and partners um, are uh, currently at the early stages of some follow-on uh, studies. Uh, one uh, study that was mentioned here today was the um, 3D bird modeling study that we're doing jointly with HD Harvey uh, that's uh, something that's just getting started. And so over the coming uh, year plus, we'll be moving forward uh, on that. And of course, we'll be reporting on uh, at once, once we're far enough along uh, there. We're also doing some um, uh, follow-on work that's uh, supported by um, um, BOEM that is associated with um, 
studying additional transmission alternatives that uh, will also move forward on a similar timeline with a lot of that work being reported out over the next year. And um, uh, so those are two, uh, two pieces, one related to transmission, one related to um, uh, environmental impact and, and birds. Um, I think that there's a need for work across a number of different areas beyond that. Um, I, uh, and um, um, you know, the, all, almost all of the work that we did on, on this study was based on um, existing literature. Um, so uh, very little primary data collection was done. Uh, and certainly in terms of the environmental impact assessment and geologic hazards presented today, that was based entirely on existing literature. I think uh, now that that first step has, has been done, it makes sense to move forward towards additional studies that do involve primary data collection around areas that are identified as being of, of, uh, of key importance. Um, and so um, uh, we are certainly interested in um, uh, looking for uh, possibilities to continue with that work on our team and, and also uh, um, others uh, that get involved in this area. Uh, so I think there is quite, quite a bit uh, to do going forward. One of the things that we'll do in the fifth session, uh, the fifth webinar in this series is spend a little bit of time talking about some of those next steps in, in, in a little bit more detail. And so I encourage people to, to tune in for that as well. And I, I think with that, um, see if anybody else uh, wants to contribute thoughts uh, on that topic. Yeah, this is Chris Potter. I, I have a little bit to add. Um, may Go I? ahead, Chris. Okay, yes, great. Please. Um, so there are a couple things. I mean, there's actually a lot underway um, being funded uh, both um, by, by the state and by the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management. Um, a couple of things that come to mind uh, that will um, come to fruition in the probably within the next year or so. Um, one is a, a modeling exercise uh, funded by the Energy Commission that will um, take a look at how a large scale commercial, a large commercial uh, wind farm would have on, on upwelling and the food web. Um, that's a rather simplistic dis description of, of the study, but we expect um, results later next year or initial results. Uh, another thing is Dr. Golden mentioned in his remarks, a study that is being uh, conducted jointly by the Conservation Biology Institute and uh, Point Blue Conservation Science. Uh, another modeling exercise looking at environmental sensitivity and conflicts analysis and results from that will be next year as well. That will be coastwide and not specific to the North Coast. Um, the other thing is that you know we're we're um, in discussions with the Humboldt Fisherman Marketing uh, Fishermen's Marketing Association about a mapping exercise that will involve um, fishermen from the North Coast in identifying their resource. Um, and then maybe I don't know. I hate to put Dave on the spot, but I, I just might uh, you might want to add some of the things that Boehm is funding. Unmute. Go ahead, Dave. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you were trying to come through. Okay. Um, thank you for... Oh, there go ahead, Dave. No, sorry. Yeah, I was having an issue with a phone ringing in the background here. Um, yeah, I mean, I could... Hey, Boehm has a lot of different things going on. I could really only speak fairly and accurately to some of the avian things that are happening. Um, you know, some of that I just mentioned earlier, we have this big data synthesis and modeling project that, um, you know, we've been working on for a number of years and that's getting close to, to being finished at this point. Um, and then we'll have some other survey or um, some other work that's coming online that should be of interest for the North Coast, some of which has been responsive to, to stakeholder comments and concerns. So we're going to be funding a study looking at uh, movements of black brant along the coast from their breeding grounds in Alaska down to um, brant. It's a type of goose. Um, 
occurs in Humboldt Bay is important for hunters and and um, and others. And um, and they winter along the Pacific coast on the Baja, but we found that they migrate offshore, especially in their southbound migration. So typically they're inside of the area of concern for interactions with wind turbines, but during that fall migration, they're susceptible. So we're gonna be funding a tracking study looking at that, and that'll be something that starts up um, in this next fiscal year coming up here. Um, so yeah, there's you know a few avian things that are, that are going on um, at the moment, but yeah, Boehm has a bunch of other things in the hopper, but I don't, I don't know that I could speak accurately to, to all of those. Okay, fantastic, thank you. It's, um, you know, as we hear from panelists and presenters, these different uh, conversations and, and resources, it's something that the project team, um, we can follow up offline and think about if there's a way to make that accessible mm -hmm. in one place for folks as a next step. Okay, so before um, closing, I will say we're running about five minutes behind. I'll do my best to get us through quickly. I, do, I, I don't wanna skimp on the thank you for the fantastic Q&A and discussion. Um, thank you to everyone who submitted questions and to all the folks who, were, who provided responses. Um, I thought it was yeah, really great from a facilitation standpoint in terms of the questions that were asked, the quality and the, the types of responses we were getting. So thank you so much to everyone for that engagement. And now I will share my screen to um, briefly discuss some next steps coming up. Okay, so again, we've mentioned this survey a few times, would love your feedback um, and your feedback is anonymous. So thank you, please and thank you. We will also drop the link into the chat and welcome you to complete the survey um, all the way through Friday, September 25th, and this, the poll will be closed. And just a reminder that feedback is anonymous, um, but it may be, uh, it, it will help to inform our summary development. So obviously, this is the second of five webinars um, in this series. So please join us next week, Monday, same time, same place, September 28th, where we will learn about port and coastal infrastructure. And then the following Monday on October 5th to learn about community perspectives on regional impacts and opportunities. And Arnie spoke a little bit about our last webinar, the fifth webinar being kind of a reflections and next steps to share information about what's, what's already in the works and what's coming up on the docket. Um, you'll note that we don't have a date yet planned for that. We're still working through that internally and we look forward to sharing information as soon as we can. Um, today's presentations and webinar recording will be posted on the SHOT Center website along with the reports um, and all the information from the first webinar is already posted there. So please check that uh, website early and often and frequent if you're looking for um, more information and uh, more content in the terms of those reports. A meeting summary will be developed that highlights the key themes from the webinar series. Questions, comments, perspectives, polls, and survey results will all be anonymous. It'll be at a very high level just for us to capture the discussion and what was of um, highest priority for our participants. And the summary will be shared with OPC with final research re reports from the SHOT Center and made available to the public. Um, the final offshore wind studies research reports and the FAQ will be also made available on the SHOT Center website. And earlier we spoke to the two or three um, reports that were relevant to today's discussion, noting that that geologic and the seismic hazards report um, will be made available in the coming weeks. So welcome you to, um, again, visit that, the SHOT website so that you can find the most up-to-date information. And just another note for our next webinar, um, 2 to 4.30, a reminder as you've been doing, please visit the SHOT Center website and register so that you can get your um, Zoom information and know where to find us to join the discussion. And you can also email windstudies at shotcenter.org to receive updates and be put on their um, mailing list so that you have information about the webinar series as well as report releases and so forth. We thought that folks on this call um, might be interested in another discussion that's happening parallel to this one. 
the California Energy Commission has posted a notice of availability um, with deadlines due by September 30th. So I think that is next week. Um, you know, if you have questions or comments, you're, you can feel free to get in contact with Chris Potter or Eli Harland. And this notice of availability and these events are related to the California Central Coast offshore wind discussion. And just a reminder that the conversation that you've just been a part of um, is very specific to the North Coast. We will also drop the CEC's request for comments on the notice for availability into the chat. So you should see that link um, and that you can click on that and that will take you there. Wanted to also highlight another webinar that's happening this week uh, risk on a risk retirement discussion. Details are shown on the screen as well as the link on Thursday, September 24th at 8 a.m. So you can find more information about that. And we do just want to say that we recognize there are many other discussions that we are aware of or unaware of, um, and our intention is not to be comprehensive in providing you with all of the other places that you should tune into for more information. These were just ones that were top of mind on our radar. Um, and so, you know, we're not intending to be exhaustive in our, um, in our list, just more sharing information that um, we welcome you to further seek out. Okay, so thank you everyone for making this second webinar series a success. I apologize for running the few minutes um, over. We do look forward to reviewing and considering the feedback that you shared with us in the survey, as well as the comments that came in through the chat and continuing the discussion next week with all of that thoughtfulness in mind. And so with that, I just wanna say a, a very big thank you. Have a great night, um, stay safe, and we really hope to see you next Monday for the next webinar. Thank you, everyone.